Okay, hello everyone. A couple of you got videos. Hi Thomas, hi Alessio. <laughs> hi Dean. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. I don't know who that was, but good morning. Good evening. <laughs> cool. I'll just uh I'll just wait a few minutes to see uh, if everyone turns up. But uh, looks like we already have 60 people here. Now, can I find Marcel and him co host? Hi, Dan. Ah, hey, Marcel. <laughs> cool, all right. Marcel, do you want to introduce yourself to everyone? OK, hi. Uh, I'm Marcel. So, so together with Dan, I'm, I'm the other main developer of, of Brian. And um, I'm, a, I'm a research engineer in, in a research institute called the Vision Institute in Paris, where I work with Romain Brett in a, in a team that is working on computation and your science and for the tutorial today uh, for the for the first part while while dan is presenting i'll be more in the background and handle stuff like uh, questions and so on and then in the in the second half or towards the end uh, i'll take a bit over and present you a project idea that we'd then like you to do on your own and we'll be around to help you with the project and hopefully get you get you all going and um, yeah get uh, uh, hopefully everyone gets something out of this project yeah cool thanks Marcel um, you should also all know Marcel wouldn't say it but I'll say it that, that Marcel is like the, the real mastermind of, uh, of Brian uh, these days um, so when I make mistakes which I surely will Marcel is going to step in and correct uh, my errors so thank you in advance for that myself. <laughs> um, cool, okay, all right, let's just have a quick chat before we start then about um, the format of this tutorial. So um, what we've got here is a, a Zoom meeting. I don't find that the interaction is terribly good on Zoom. Um, so we've got a few things set up to try and make that uh, work better. So. First of all, yes, please do use the, the Zoom chat. Uh, I can see that um, Alexander is saying, nice to see so many Neuromatch people. And indeed, hello, all the Neuromatch people. <laughs> um, so on top of that, we're going to have a couple, of, um, a couple of other things. And I'm going to share my screen now so I can, uh, I can show you some of those other things. Dun, dun. Okay, all right. Hopefully, you're all seeing my screen now. I'm sure, if I can't see the Zoom chat anymore. A way to make it so that I can see the Zoom chat when I'm sharing one screen, another screen. Don't say it in chat because I'm not seeing chat. Anymore. Okay, I can I can pop out some windows. Great. All set. Cool. Okay, great. Now I can see the chat. Brilliant. All right. So um, so what we have um, on on top of uh, me talking with this uh, with this shared screen, which hopefully everyone can hear. Um, Oh, the sound is noisy. I wonder, is that, is that the sound of my fan? No, it's better now? Yes, it's better now. It's better now? 
Yeah. Okay, I, I can go and grab um, a, a headset if it's if it's distracting. Um, but let's just see if it, it may have just been that it was taking a moment to start uh, to start up, and then it'll start sort of suppressing that noise. In the end. Okay, let's hope so. Okay, so what we're going to do is throughout the tutorial, if you want to um, ask questions and not have them lost in the chat, can you go to this page down here? So you go to menti.com, um, you enter this code, uh, and you can ask questions on that page and also vote on the questions. Um, for those of you who Crowdcast, it's a sort of like ad hoc version of, of Crowdcast. So someone's saying they can't see it? Okay, no, we can so see it. Is that, all right. How about if I put it like that? Yeah, no, that's okay. Sorry. Uh, we couldn't see it before. So, yeah. Okay, I go. Ah, it's probably just because it was, uh, okay. Like that works? Yes. Brilliant. Okay, cool. Okay, so you go to menti.com and you enter this code and you can ask questions and vote on the questions there. And Marcel will try and answer questions in chat. Uh, and otherwise, if it requires like demonstrating something, I think Marcel is just going to interrupt me and ask the question and we can, uh, we can answer it on the screen. So that's how we're going to handle doing, um, doing questions. That's obviously going to be the most relevant ones where I should start going through stuff. Um, in addition, I'm leaving this information up here uh, for people who join later. Basically, this page has the instructions, which you can see online here, for uh, how to install Brian. Um, and we're also going to have this page open. It's a sort of editable document, framer.link slash Brian dash tutorial. Um, and I can show you that. Um, This one, I think. Yeah. Okay. So this is a, a sort of publicly editable page. Anyone can just click on this link and edit this page. We've got some, we've seeded it with some sort of useful information. Um, please feel free also to put in notes and code and all sorts of things in there as we go. And again, Marcel will be, uh, will be watching that. All right. So let's get on with. Um, how to get Brian installed and running. Hopefully, most of you will have done that already. Um, if you want to start doing it now, the information is on this page. And I'm just going to quickly talk through how you, how you do that. So the first thing is you have to get your Python version, the version of Python installed. These days, we're always thinking that you should be using uh, Python 3. Um, in fact, I think of, as of the latest version of Brian, we no longer support Python 2. Uh, as it has been um, fully deprecated. Um, so download Anaconda Python if you haven't already got a Python installed. It's a particularly easy uh, to install and use one. Um, if you go to Anaconda page, it's just you go to here, click download, and then you just choose your version of your installer and, uh, and it's pretty quick. And it comes with a whole bunch of stuff already installed. Okay, so having done that, the way uh, we work typically um, with Anaconda is we create virtual environments. And I'll show you a little bit um, how to do that. So the first thing you want to do, by the way, can everyone read the text OK um, at, this, at this size? Yeah, OK. Right, good. Yeah, I zoomed in a little bit, so it should be, it should be quite easy. OK, so here's, uh, all right, so let's load up a, a command window here. Do. Okay, so here's the directory that I'm going to be running in. Command window, drag that on the screen. All right. So in Conda, you have um, you have virtual environments which have a name. Um, so I'm just going to show you the ones that I've got installed online. So I type in Conda and list, and I get a list of my uh, the different environments I have installed here. So you can see I've got a bunch installed already. What you do uh, for this tutorial is you're going to create one called Brian underscore tutorial, conda create minus n, that's name Brian tutorial. So that's 
that creates a uh, an environment whose name is Brian Tutorial. Um, minus C Condorforge. Condorforge is um, a sort of third party um, system for providing like binary installs and stuff like that. And Brian is on Condorforge, so you just write minus C to include the channel Condorforge. Uh, you want Python version three. You want to have Brian two installed. You want to have Matplotlib installed. Matplotlib is the plotting uh, plotting library that we use throughout this. In this tutorial, we're going to use Jupyter Notebook. Um, I'll show you that in a minute, but uh, Notebook is what you want to install to, uh, to see that. Um, and in addition, we're going to have NB Conda kernels. Um, basically, if, if this is the first time, first thing you've installed, this isn't essential. Uh, if you have multiple environments and you already had Jupyter installed, uh, installing this NB Conda kernels thing here will make sure that everything runs smoothly. If you run my previous uh, instructions that I tweeted and was in my first email and I had forgotten to include this, then um, you can just write uh, conda install nb conda kernels now to, to make sure that that works. Um, but if you already had your own uh, conda set up, you're probably uh, safe to know, know what you're doing anyway, so no need to worry about that. Okay, so the next thing you do is you, you activate that um, that environment. Okay, so let's do that now. So you go conda activate Brian tutorial. Okay, and now you're seeing a command line here. It says Brian tutorial. That means that environment is activated. Uh, and basically now things that are installed in other environments won't be seen here. Um, and you basically you, you keep all of your 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 sort of programming environments separated so that. Um, uh, so that they don't interfere with each other. So if you need like one particular version on one project and an older version, say for another project or a newer version for another project, you can have all of these different environments installed simultaneously um, with or without them interfering with each other. And that's actually really good, especially for sort of reproducibility of your code. Uh, a, a very good practice that I'm not going to talk about now because I don't want to get, spend too much time on that sort of thing is to actually create uh, a specification of that environment in a file um, and periodically sort of like recreate it to make sure that indeed your code is running with exactly that specification that will make sure that your, your code is easily reproducible okay so we're also going to install uh brian two tools which is basically uh, a collection of just like handy little bits and bobs added to brian um that is in a in a separate package uh, and to do that actually we have to use pip in this case uh, the only reason for that is that the um the version that we uploaded to conda is a little bit old of this uh and it will just complicate the complicate the install if you try and install this via conda um and and throw up some weird messages so we just install that with pip for the moment uh, we'll update that Sooner, sooner or later, and then we'll just version for that with Conda later. Okay, all right. Now, at that point, we want to launch a Jupyter notebook. So, um, to do that, you just type Jupyter and then notebook. And I hit enter. And after a few moments, this pops up. Okay, so this is what Jupyter notebook looks like. Um, and here is a couple of notebooks that I've already created, and I'll be creating a new one in a moment. Okay, so if you've got to this point, um, Brian, is, 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 uh, your, your installation is probably working well. Okay, uh, and we'll get to that in a second. But before, um, before I get into uh, too much into how Jupyter Notebook works, I just want to say if you haven't got it installed, there are a couple of options that you can use straight away. Um, so a couple of people are mentioning it that you can use Google Colab. Um, so for Google Colab, you just go to colab.google.com uh, uh, or colab.research.google.com, um, create a notebook. And if you just put these two lines, um, exclamation mark pip install brand two, exclamation mark pip install brand two tools as the first cell, it'll just work away installing for a few minutes uh, and then uh, and then you'll be able to use uh, Brian um, exactly the same as, as I'm going to be doing in, the, in my Jupyter notebook. Um, so that works very well. 
Okay. The other option is if you, for whatever reason, don't like Google, you can use Binder. Um, so I will open this link here. And we'll see if it actually works today. So Binder is basically um, a free equivalent uh, of um, of Google Prolab, more or less, provided by uh, I think charitable donations from various sort of like open science sort of organisations. Um, and if you click that link, you'll it might take a few seconds to load up, but you'll, you'll jump into this. So this is our Brian uh, binder. Uh, and basically, you're, you're running the code externally here, and Brian is already uh, previously installed. So you can either use this notebook, or it's got a bit of uh, junk in it. It's got links to the tutorials and some examples and things like that. But you can also just go File, New Notebook, um, Python 3, and then you can just start uh, doing stuff. And, okay. So, so that's, uh, that can be used as well. I'm going to close that now because I'm going to run it locally. So that will work for me. All right. So that's two options. Oh, by the way, um, for Binder, your code is not saved. Um, so if you are working on Binder and you want to save what you've done, make sure that you do download a copy. I think it has a timeout of half an hour or something like that. So if you don't make any edit in half an hour, in 20 minutes, I'm not sure. Um, it will uh, it will delete what you've done. Google Colab uh, is better for that. Okay, all right. Um, what was I going to talk about? Okay. All right, so let's let's uh, get started quickly in Jupyter Notebook. Okay, so I'm going to make a new uh, notebook. And you see here, because I've got ND Conda kernels, I can create a new notebook using any of those existing environments if I want to. Uh, in fact, I just want to make one that runs in the branch tutorial environment. So I click new and I click there. Um, and we have a brand new empty notebook. Okay, so the way um, Jupyter Notebook works, if you haven't seen it before, is you have a series of cells um, which uh, you can write code in, and when you run them, you can run them independently, the results will come afterwards. So you can say this before, you can do something like think three times five. If I press control enter, it will run that cell. Um, if I press shift enter, it will run that cell and create a new one below. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of keyboard shortcuts that I won't go into now, but uh, it's uh, it'll just help you, um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you, you can use the uh, you can use the, the sort of toolbars to do everything if you want. But once you start using it for a lot of stuff, you'll probably want to uh, learn some of the keyboard shortcuts. Okay, um, and you can also you can do nice stuff with this, um, just in case people haven't seen it. So I can convert that to a markdown cell. I just did that with a keyboard shortcut. Um, and then I can do stuff like uh, writing some text. There, just control enter, and it gets uh, nicely formatted. Um, yeah. So, uh, so it's really nice to use Jupyter, I think, when developing a model, particularly because you can intersperse code, figures, and also nice text descriptions. Um, of, uh, of of what your model is doing. So at the end, if you if you do it uh, if you do it well, you can end up more or less having um, your paper having been written in the process of developing. Uh, and these days, I, for example, and, and other people as well, are trying to release our our interactive uh, papers like that. So essentially, we have more or less the complete paper, but as a notebook, so that you can not only read the paper and look at the figures, but you can actually edit and run the code and, and, uh, and make changes to it. Yeah. Um, cool. Okay. So I'm going to delete those two cells. Um, I'll just change this one. Before we get into Brian, I'll just quickly show you. I'm, I'm going to use matplotlib to do the plot set. Uh, and this little code, this special code here, it's not part of Python, it's part of uh, Jupyter Notebook. 
uh, it's called a cell magic. Um, so if I write uh, percent, then the rest is, is the cell magic thing. In this case, I'm doing a, a matplotlib um, magic command, and I'm saying that figures should be shown in line. So I do that, um, and I'll show you the effect of that. And import lib like that. And I'm just going to plot some random data just to see if this works. Yep, there we go. Okay, look. All right, so this is basically this is how 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 it's going to work with uh, uh, with with uh, Jupyter notebook. Cool. All right. Um, I will have a quick pause here to see if there's already any questions. Uh, Marcel, do you want to relay anything that's been, that's been going on? There was initially a question about a problem on Google Collab, but I think that solved itself. I think it was a missing from Brian to import star or something. Uh, there's another question on Mentimeter, but it's really, uh, it's, it's a very specific code question not related to your tutorial. So I asked the person to ask in the chat, maybe for the person that asked a question, I cannot see who is it, who it is, but uh, could, uh, could you please um, copy paste your equations on the etherpad? And then I can, I can reply there and mark the question as answered because it's, it's not a general question that would be interesting for everyone to to have answered, I think. But apart from that, I think everyone is following along nicely. Maybe, uh, I'm not sure we mentioned it. If you if you open the participants tab in, in Zoom, you have the option to say, go slower, go faster, um, yes, no. And we actually, uh, uh, we actually see an overview over all the, um, yeah, over what everyone said, so, so, uh, also, when, when Dan asks something like, is this okay for everyone or so, you could just click there on yes or no or a thumb up, thumb down, and, and then we'll see, we get an overview how it works for, for everyone. Um, that's maybe easier than, than 100 people saying yes in the chat. Um, but apart from that, I think everyone is following along nicely so far. So. Oh. Okay, yep. so I'll get on to talking about importing Brian and everything. I, I see that someone's asking about it being recorded. Yes, it's being recorded, and so far I haven't humiliated myself, so I will upload it as long as uh, nothing disastrous happens uh, during this tutorial. Okay, all right. So now let's talk about um, let's talk about Brian in that case. So there's lots of different ways you, that you can uh, work with and import Brian. I'm, I'm going to show you what the, the simplest one here, and this is what in, appears in all of our tutorials and examples. Um, it's actually not a Python best practice to do this, um, but it really simplifies things a lot. So this, <clears throat> this notation uh, is how you import packages in Python, right? So we're saying from the package Brian2, um, import star. And what star means is import absolutely everything um, that is in Brian, or actually rather everything that we specified that should be imported in this, in this star. And not only that, it also imports matplotlib and a whole bunch of uh, handy little functions that we use all the time uh, in programming, in, uh, in sort of Brian, Brian code writing. Um, so that's how we're going to do it here. But there are other ways you can do it. So the, the more uh, classic approach um, is how, about how to import would be to do something like import Brian2 as B2. Now, if you do that, when you're using it, you're going to have to write things like B2 dot num rather than just your own group. So it makes the code a bit uh, wordier. Um, but it makes um, it makes it clear where every name is coming from. Uh, it generally it will lead to you making fewer errors, but you'll also do more typing essentially. Um, so I'm I'm not going to do it this way because it's going to simplify um, the tutorial. And I should also say I've never really had a problem doing it this way. Um, for my own code, I tend to write this rather than the, the best practice way. And I think that that's partly because Brian is 
it's almost like its own thing rather than just a Python package. Um, so if you're if you're writing it this way, the idea is that you're going to be. It's not that you're you know writing some library that builds on Brian. It's you're writing a script with Brian. If you're writing a library that builds on Brian, then you might want to use the the other approach. Um, uh, yeah, and I see someone saying, yeah, there's no name conflicts. Exactly. So, I mean, yeah, but let's not get into that. Anyway, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a conversation for another time. Cool. Okay. So, I'm going to do from Brian in Port Scar. I'm going to run that cell. Okay. And this warning pops up. And I, I see that was being discussed a little bit in the chat. Um, I'm not exactly sure why this is happening at the moment. I think it's probably because we haven't yet updated something with when some version of some library changed or something. Uh, Marcel can maybe uh, tell me. But anyway, I think that this will probably be fixed for the next release of Brian. And it causes no problem whatsoever. It's just, uh, it's just a warning. Is that right, Marcel? Yeah, so, so far I didn't see that it uh, hurts in any way. It seems to be, I think, nothing on our side changed. It's just that the most recent version of Setup Tools adds a warning for, for something that we are doing, but um, it seems to work fine. But I mean, we, we'll get rid of the warning with the with next update of, of Brian, but so far I didn't see that it uh, is any problem. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, now, the other thing that I'm going to do, um, which is very specific to, uh, to this tutorial, is I'm going to set refs.cogen.target to numpy. Um, so normally you wouldn't do this. So a bit of background here is that behind the scenes, when you run Brian code, um, what it does is it generates um, like lower level code in a target language, compiles, and then runs that. And normally that will that that lower level target language will be C++, um, and therefore the code will will run very fast. Um, but you can also set it to just use NumPy, um, and that is first of all that's easier for compatibility. That will this will this is guaranteed to run in every system, whereas the C++ one you need to have a, a compiler and system. Um, and um, the other reason is that. It's actually a little bit, for, for very, very simple code, this is actually a little bit quicker. And the reason is basically you don't have to do any compilation. When you are, are generating NumPy code and running NumPy code, everything is within Python. You don't have to wait for an external compiler to run uh, and then execute that code. So actually for very tiny examples, this one is often quicker than the standard uh, C++ um, sort of computational backend. So because Sorry, Dan. Just right. quickly to interrupt that, there's a bit of a noise coming up again. Maybe it's when your fan is turning or something. Yeah. Which uh, now, now it's stopped. So it's 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 okay, but I don't know. If okay. I tell you noise. what. Let's um let's take a quick pause. Uh, I will go and grab my uh, headphones with um with a with a, with a little microphone so that we don't get that fan noise. Um, okay. Yeah. Shortly. Um, yeah, actually, how about um, Marcel? Do you want to answer any other questions? And, and I see there's some questions about C++ while I go and while I go. And... Right. Yeah. Maybe I'm 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 currently typing typing stuff in the chat. Maybe I can instead answer them. Um, so, um, boop boop boop. Yeah, there, there was a question of whether it's necessary to to create a Python environment for the tutorial. And no, that's not strictly necessary. You can have all your all your Python packages within the same environment, or even using your own um, the the system wide Python installation. But in general, it's good practice to uh, in in the best case, kind of like for each independent project, or more general for for each kind of environment, you need to have a separate environment because that can uh, that can avoid a lot of trouble. So. It can happen that you install Brian, everything is working fine. Then you have another project where you use another bunch of libraries and those for those you have to update some package to a new version. But then this means that Brian doesn't work anymore. So it can, can become a, a big mess, especially if you use uh, many different softwares, many different libraries. So in general, I'd, I'd strongly recommend to have separate environments for, for separate projects or, or projects, uh, broadly speaking. 
it could be for for Brian, one for Brian projects, for example, because this this way you're sure once it works, it it works and it will continue to work regardless of updates to to other um, to other things. So the question about the default uh, backend. So actually, when you don't set a backend, um, then Brian will try to use a C++ backend that is based on Cython. So the uh, you'd write prefs.codegen.target equals uh, Cython, but you don't have to do it because Brian uses it automatically. And only if it cannot use it because Cython is not installed or C++ is not installed, it will fall back to this NumPy Python backend that um, Dan is now using in the in the tutorial because for very simple examples, that's actually better. There's another thing. Um, that is what we call the C++ standalone backend. I'm not sure whether Dan will talk about this during the tutorial. It's a bit different. You set it in a bit of different way and there's some restrictions on what code you can run with it. But in general, it's the fastest way of running code. So for now, maybe I'll refer you to the documentation about this question. And it, but regardless of um, this, where, when you use uh, Cython, at the, which creates Cython code, which gets turned into C++ code, um, the code is saved into, uh, into a special um, Cython cache directory. So if Brian afterwards encounters exactly the same code, uh, it will not generate it again, but see that it already has it compiled and, and will reuse that. That is why often if you do a uh, new um, code, like we do in the tutorials all the time, um, then the first the first time you run the code will take a bit of time because it generates the codes, compiles it and so on. But the next time it will start much quicker because it already has the code compiled. I can just it, use it right away. We have with recent versions in Brian, we have a command to clean this cache, which can be useful if you use Brian a lot, and especially, well, we as developers obviously use it a lot. And we do stuff like running the test suit, which runs tons of um, code. And in this case, sometimes the cache directory can get very big. And maybe some of you already saw that. Um, now, I think if the cache directory exceeds the size of uh, one gigabyte, you get a warning uh, telling you that the cache directory is very big, telling you about the clear cache command that will clean up, uh, clean up the cache. Cool. Um, right. Um, is the audio now coming through better? Is it coming through with this microphone? Yeah, it looks, yeah, it feels like you're closer to my ears now. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. It's, uh, yeah, I think okay. it's, it's clear right now. Good, good, good. Okay, so I'll hand, hand off to, to you again. Okay, great, and we'll continue uh, with this tutorial. Okay, all right, so now we've got to the point uh, where we have uh, imported Brian. So, um, so that's really sort of like a, a sort of minimum thing that we would want to do. Okay, all right, so let's, uh, let's get started. Um, Okay, someone's saying a much better sound. Okay, that's great. Yeah, no, I, I should probably have done that from the beginning, but uh, it's a really hot day here in London and I didn't really want to have a headset on if I could avoid it. Um, but yeah, I probably should have just uh, bitten the bullet right from the beginning on that. Um, okay, so right, before we get into Brian, I'm just going to very quickly introduce uh, the, the unit system. So one of the nice things about Brian, or at least from my point of view, uh, is that it has a built-in system for handling um, quantities with uh, physical dimensions, right? So I can write things like uh, three times volt, right? Um, and this is meaningful. So for example, suppose I wrote 3000 times millivolt and I press enter, it's gonna know that that's the same thing as three, uh, three volts. So I could add plus one times volt. Okay, so it, uh, it, it's correctly understanding um, what those units are. And the other thing is it's, it's going to help you um, from not making um, mistakes with the dimensions. So for example, suppose that I wanted to do two times millivolts plus one times nanoamps. Um, let's see what happens if I run that. Okay, so what happens is that doesn't make sense. And Brian tells you it doesn't make sense by uh, raising um, an exception. <clears throat> um, so 
if you haven't seen this before, um, this is a Python traceback. Um, and basically it shows you where the error came from um, and what the error is. So the way to read these is first of all, just go right down to the bottom and look at the message right at the bottom, uh, which should basically summarize what the problem was. So here the error type was dimension mismatch error. Uh, and the message is it cannot calculate two millivolts plus one nanoamp because the units don't match. The units are volt and amp. Okay. So, uh, so that's the error. Now the rest of this basically tells you where that error came from. So at the top is the most recent call, as it says here, uh, and it's just showing you the line in your code uh, where that error came, which led to that error happening. And then the next one down is what, uh, what Python call um, that went into and what function, what method call that went into and what method call that went into until it gets to the point where actually the error is actually raised. So typically what you want to know is where in your code the problem went wrong and all of the rest of this is essentially irrelevant to you because it'll just be a whole bunch of uh, lines of Brian code. Um, the only exception to that is when you're actually trying to debug a problem with Brian, you want to know what caused the error to, uh, to come up. So usually you should just look at the, the very top which will tell you which line the problem happened on and the very bottom which will tell you what the error is. Okay. Um, yes, um, very good. All right, so that's uh, a little bit about how units work. And we'll get onto that. The unit checking is, is, is quite pervasive. So for example, if you, uh, if you write differential equations with inconsistent units, it'll, it'll catch that and all sorts of problems like that. And we'll, we'll get onto that in a minute. All right, so let's actually finally get, start getting onto uh, to match your neurons. Let's uh, create a leaky integrate and fire neuron to get started with. Okay, so the leaky integrate and fire neuron um, is, okay, let's, let's, let's demonstrate um, the, the nice feature of uh, Jupyter Notebook. It is defined by the equations. dv by dt is negative v let's say. Okay, there we go. There's a nice representation of uh, the, the equation in the leaky integrated fire neuron. Okay, so this is a differential equation which governs the evolution of the membrane potential over time. Um, and the way we're going to represent that in Brian is with a multi-line string. Um, in case you haven't seen a multi-line string in Python before, a multi-line string it starts with a triple quote and ends with a triple quote and you can have multiple lines in between. So it's basically a way of writing a string that goes across multiple lines. Um, and we could, uh, for example, print that. And there you go, you see it's a, it's a string with multiple lines in it. Okay, so we define equations via multi-line strings where each uh, line has an equation on it. And we can basically more or less define it exactly as in the differential equations above. So we write dv, dv by dt is negative v divided by tau. Uh, the only restriction here is that it has to be of the form d something by dt equals something. Um, so to transform this equation up here into this form down here, I've divided both sides by tau. Okay. Um, oh, quick bit of feedback. Is the text size okay for everyone? Is it easily readable? Okay. Cool. Okay. So now the additional thing that we need to do here is we just write this one extra little bit. We write colon one. I'll, I'll explain more about that in a second. But basically, what this is doing is it's defining the units of the variable being defined. So this equation is defining what v does, and one is the unit of that. And we could make that volt, for example. We write volt in here instead. Okay, uh, and we can, we can write anything we like here. So this defines what the unit of V is. So I'm gonna make that one. And then we create some neurons by creating a neuron group object. We're gonna create just one neuron and it's gonna have those equations. Okay, now if I run that, there we go. Sure enough, it works. Um, of course, you're not seeing anything at the moment. 
but actually we can already see the unit checking in place here. Now suppose that we had written, as many people might have seen, just dv by dt is minus v. What would happen? If I run that and, ah, okay, the error only comes when I actually run it. Is that right, Marcel? Yeah, exactly. That, uh, that's actually uh, exactly the same question that someone just asked on, on Mentimeter um, with an with a incorrect equation. You, you only get the errors uh, when you run it. And this has to do with the fact that normally, in, in general, to check the consistency of units, we also have to know uh, the values of external constants, even though in this case, I mean, this, this equation is so simple. But so, so the point where this is checked is when uh, yeah, when we run the network. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So good that that came up. Okay, so let's let's uh, let's let's create the problem here. So this time I'm gonna I'm gonna run this, and an error is gonna come up. And you might say, why why is there an error? This seems like a perfectly reasonable definition. And mathematically, this is a perfectly reasonable definition of a differential equation, but it raises a dimension mismatch error. Um, doo -doo -doo, where is it? So, dimension mismatch error, inconsistent unit in differential equation defining the variable v. Expression minus v does not have the expected unit, which is, well, it hurts. That's one over time. Um, so basically, it's expecting the right-hand side of this expression to have units of one over time. Why? Because the left-hand side is a differential. So it actually has units of whatever the units of v are divided by time right because it's a dv over a dt so this has units of time this has units that's just one so the right hand side should also have units of one divided by time okay um, you might think this is just being a bit finickety but actually it matters because suppose that you measured time in seconds or you measured time in milliseconds this equation would give different results um, depending on on that however if you make it dimensionally consistent it now doesn't matter whether or not you're measuring time in milliseconds or seconds, it, it will just work. Um, so it's actually going to save you from making errors. Um, and, uh, and those errors do kind of matter. Um, like, um, what was it? Was it the Mars probe that missed Mars because someone entered the, uh, some number into it in the wrong units? Um, and as a consequence, this sort of like multi million dollar spaceship flew off into space. Um, so, you know, those, those, those errors can matter. Probably what we do doesn't, doesn't have quite such a big effect as that, but still it can be very annoying. Okay, uh, all right, so if I run that now, we're also gonna get an error. Um, and this error is basically the identifier tau could not be resolved. And that's just because we haven't defined what tau is. So let's say that tau is 10 milliseconds. And I run that again, great, okay, now it runs. Yep. Okay, so tau is 10 milliseconds. Um, and you can see here, it's brought up some information here. It says no numerical, no numerical integration method was specified for the neuron group. So using method exact. Um, so basically, it will try and guess which is the best or most sensible numerical integration method to use if you don't specify one. Um, if, you, if you want to not see this warning, uh, it's no problem that it's done that. Uh, you can specify it explicitly. So let's do that. And in fact, we're going to use the method uh, that it's suggesting to. The exact method only works for um, linear differential equations. Um, and it will, as it suggests, solve them exactly because they can be solved exactly. Uh, for nonlinear ones, you might want to use Euler or you might want to use RK2 or one of the others. Um, and we'll probably switch to Euler in a second when I start doing some nonlinear stuff. But, uh, but yeah, let's start with that. Okay. Um, all right, we can't really see very much so far. So let's create a state monitor object. So state monitor is a way of recording um, one of the variables of the simulation as it runs. So by default, we don't record what happens during uh, oh, so there's a question here about magic error. Um, yeah, if you want that not to happen, write start scope at the top of the cell. Uh, I'll talk about that in, in a moment, um, but if you're getting that error, just put start scope at the top of the cell uh, and that should stop. 
Um, okay, so by default, Brian doesn't record all of the variables that, uh, that happened during the simulation because that would be massive. If you imagine, you know, like a million neurons and loads of synapses and whatever, and you run it for some amount of time, you, you would generate gigabytes and gigabytes of data uh, and you'd quickly run out of memory. So we don't do that. Um, if you want to record something, you have to say what it is that you want to record. So in this case, I want to record the states of the neuron. Uh, and it's from the group of neurons called G. Um, I want to record the state V. Uh, and I do actually want to record it uh, at every time step. So I use this record equals true argument, which I'll come back to in a second. I run the network for... Um, well, let's run it for 10, 100 milliseconds. Actually, let's also initialize the, the, so by default, V will be initialized to zero. So let's set V to 0 0.5 at the start. Okay. Uh, run it for 100 milliseconds. And now let us plot, um, ah, okay. Let's use Brian tools at this point. So Brian tools, has this special function called Brian plot, which automates the plotting of some Brian objects. So if we run Brian plot on M, it should just give us a quick plot of, uh, of what it recorded. Let's just run that now so we can have a look at it. Why is Brian plot not defined? Because I didn't import Brian two tools. So there we go. We're also gonna import Brian two tools. Let's try running that again. There we go. So this behaves more or less like what you would expect, I think. At the time zero, we set the value of V to be 0 0.5. Um, and then nothing else is happening other than it's decaying exponentially uh, according, to, uh, according to this. So it goes until it's more or less zero at time 100 milliseconds. And it's got a time constant of 10 milliseconds as expected. Um, someone's asking, do you get cab tab completions for Brian? Uh, you should do. Um, yep, I'm getting them. So in Jupyter Notebook, if you want tab completions, you press shift tab. Uh, in other IDEs, it's just tab, but in, uh, in, in uh, Jupyter, it's shift tab. Well, that's just to bring up the documentation, actually. Does Jupyter Notebook have tab completions or does it just have the shift tab? That's a good question. Yeah, no, it's got tab completions. Okay, so that should be working. Okay, all right. So that's more or less working as expected. And by the way, if you're wondering what this is doing, this is equivalent to um, the time of each plotting point is recorded in m dot t, that's time. Um, We'll divide that by milliseconds so that the x-axis is in milliseconds. And on the y-axis, we will plot v from uh, neuron zero. And you can see that's, that's the same thing. But the Brian plot has also labeled the axes a bit for you. Okay, so we'll just use Brian plot. Okie doke. Um, Good, all right, maybe I will just, there's quite a lot of chat coming up, so maybe I'll just give a quick pause now to, uh, to see if we can uh, make some progress on some of those questions that are coming in. Marcel, do you want to uh, summarize uh, some of that? Yeah, may, may, maybe just a quick comment because they're on, on Mentimeter, there are a number of questions as well, but there are a lot of questions about how to do synaptic connections in various ways. I think we'll we, get to that later. we respond to these questions, yeah. Yeah till we get to them. Um, to, 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 uh, yeah, there are plenty of questions now all in, in parallel. Uh, there's some contextual version conflict. Okay, I'm not sure we're going to. So about the default step size that came up. So by default, Brian um, simulates with 0 0.1 milliseconds and then is uh, showing how you can change this. So there's an attribute That's called default, default clock.dt. And you can also specify that per object. So for example, I could write here that I only want to record it in one millisecond steps by just specifying dt equals one millisecond um, or whatever you like. So I think every Brian object more or less has this as an option, this dt. 
Right, yeah, indeed. And it can be especially useful, I mean, for, I would be a bit careful with it for, um, for neuron groups and synapses because, um, well, we don't have synapses yet, but you can imagine that objects are connected to each other and if they use different clocks, sometimes um, this can give strange results. But um, one, and so, so in, in general, I would say for, for most cases, if you want to change the default time step, you rather change the, the uh, default clock.tt, so change the time step for everything. But one thing that can be very useful is change the DT of a state monitor, especially if you have very complex neural models uh, where you need a quite low time step to, to simulate them accurately. Recording the membrane potential at every time step can, can use quite a lot of memory and you, you're not actually interested in the, uh, in the membrane potential at that much detail. So in that case, you could just add a DT to the state monitor with a bigger time step, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so someone's asking me is why we defined V as, as um, uh, one rather than volt. Okay, let, let's change that. So it's just to show that the point that you, it can work with uh, volt. Okay, if I just run this code as is, changing that one to a volt, I'm gonna get a problem. And that problem is because here, um, I've said that V should be 0 0.5 without specifying uh, what it is. So if I make that into 0 0.5 millivolts, uh, now this should work. Yep, there we go. It still works. You just have to make sure that everything you do is uh, is dimensionally consistent, and then that will work. Uh, to simplify things, I'll just put that back to being uh, just one again. Okay. Um, there's there's quite there's a few other things. Is that so? Uh, do you want to handle most of that in in chat there, Marcel? It looks like quite a lot. Of yeah. So, so a number of people have no issues with like running that. running Brian plots in Google Colab. Uh, I don't know. I, I have to to check what the issue is there. It's not something that I can can solve right away. So it might be worth. I mean, you did it already for that plot, but worth showing how to plot things without Brian plot as yep. well for for later plots. Okay. So so for uh, those people that are having issues with Brian plot, just plot it without Brian yeah, plot. Yeah, you can use this. It's the same. Uh, it won't have the nice labels, but otherwise, it's the same. Um, yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, right. So, all right. At this point, I think I would probably like to show um, something that makes this equation based approach interesting. So, here we've got a very standard sort of um, differential equation, um, but you can also do some some sort of you know some fun interesting stuff here you can write anything you like up here uh, as long as it's dimensionally consistent so let's just try um, throwing in a current which is going to be sine 2 pi ft um, as an input current right so in this case this this uh, membrane is being driven by an incoming uh, current which is sinusoidally oscillating and it's leaking that's the minus V term. Um, and we're going to need to define a frequency. Um, let's say, uh, I don't know, 50 hertz. Uh, maybe 100 hertz. Let's see how it looks. Okay. And all right. So uh, when I run this, it's going to give an error, um, I believe. Yep. Uh, and the error is because uh, we can't exactly integrate this. So, so, so the expression sine 2 pi ft is not guaranteed to be, to be constant over a time step. If we wanted to use the exact integration method, this thing uh, is, is causing the problem because it's not constant over a time step. So I'm going to just switch that now to using the Euler integration method and run that again. And there you go. You can see uh, that this is what happens when this neuron is now being driven by this sinusoidally oscillating current. Cool. Okay, so hopefully that gives you an idea of the, the advantage of this equation-based approach. And you don't, by the way, you don't only have to have one equation here. You can have multiple equations that interact with each other. Um, and whatever you like. Okay. Uh, but let's stick with this for the moment. All right, so let's now make this a little bit more um, like a neuron by having a threshold and a reset. Um, so what we'll do, what we'll say 
is we'll say that this neuron uh, should fire a spike when V crosses the threshold one. And after it fires a spike, V should reset to zero. So that's how we specify that. And again, that's a fairly sort of standard leaky integrate and fire sort of a thing to do. Um, now, if I run this, it's not going to do anything because as you can see here, this never crosses, uh, never crosses one. Um, let's see if we put this as, uh, let's start it off at 0.9 and strengthen that a bit. We should probably see the effect of that. Why didn't that work? Oh, that's because I used a little V rather than a big V. Do you know what? I'm probably going to make that mistake a lot of time. I'm going to change these big Vs to little Vs because it's going to save me typing. Oh, why did I make the mistake? <laughs> I regret. I have regrets. Okay. There we go. Right. Actually, I'm going to start it off at zero. I'm going to remove that line. Uh, and I'm going to make this input current bigger. Okay, so you can kind of see a little bit about um, what's going on here. So the, the current initially comes up, it comes up and it hits one. And then it fires a spike. It resets to zero. And it goes up and up and up again. If I just run it for 20 milliseconds, we can look at that a bit more clearly. Yeah. So here you go. You can see that the, current, the, the, the membrane potential goes up, 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 hits one, fires a spike, resets, goes up and up, hits one, fires a spike, resets, and so on. Uh, and then afterwards, it's uh, a different phase of the uh, curve. It's, uh, it's going to follow that. It's not going to fire a spike until it gets up to here again. Okay. Um, all right. And so again, you can, you can mess around with all of this stuff, right? You don't have to uh, have a, a simple number that it has to cross in a simple reset like this. Um, let's just mess around a little bit here by changing the reset to uh, minus rand. Okay. So rand uh, is, a, a, is a NumPy function and a, a recognized by Brian that just returns a uniformly distributed uh, random number between zero and one. So now I'm going to say, after you fire a spike, reset to uh, a, a number that is between zero and minus one, randomly selected. So I run that. Um, and you can see the effect of that here. After this spike, it's dropped to this value. After this spike, it's dropped to this value. Um, let's drive this neuron a little bit more to get more spikes. Okay, yeah, so you can see, here you go, it's after this one, it's dropped to about 0.75, here minus 0.25, here about that again, here about that minus 0.75 again. Okay. Um, and so you can, do, you can do whatever you like in these thresholds and resets. And uh, I guess I could illustrate that by, yeah, let's illustrate that with an example of a, a sort of adaptive neuron model, adaptive threshold neuron model. So what I'm going to do for the adaptive threshold is I'm going to have a new variable VT, which is going to be the threshold. And VT is also going to have a differential equation. And it's going to decay to the value 1. Um, with time step tau t. And that time step, uh, that time constant, sorry, is going to be a little bit longer. Let's say it's 50 milliseconds. Um, and now the threshold is going to be that v has to cross vt. Uh, and let's put the reset back to, back to zero again, just to simplify things for the moment. Except that uh, I'm also going to have that vt increases by a certain amount after each spike. Okay. And then uh, a couple of people mentioned that in your equation for dvt, you probably yep. want, yeah. Yeah, good spot. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Um, all right, and now we should initialize vt 
left with value one. And I'm gonna get rid of the sinusoidal current for a moment just to demonstrate what's going on here a bit more clearly. So it's just gonna have a current that's enough to drive it to spike, right? So by default, this uh, V wants to go exponentially towards the value 1.5. Um, Vt by default is at about one. So if it wants to get to uh, 0 0.5, um, then let's make that a little bit bigger too. If it wants to get to uh, two, it will, uh, it will cross VT at some point and that will cause it to spike. So we'll see that in a second. Um, and maybe let's run that for a little bit longer. Okay. And yes, so we're seeing that, um, but we're not seeing VT. So I'm actually gonna have to do a bit more plotting here. So at the moment, M is just recording V. So let's have another state monitor that's recording VT. And let's plot that as well. Run that again. There we go. Okay, so the blue curve is V and the orange curve is VT. So now you can see, see what's going on here. VT starts at one and V starts at zero. Um, v is trying to get to the value two but it hits the orange curve, it hits VT, it fires a spike and it resets. And after it fires a spike and resets, VT increases by 0 0.5, right? VT increases after that spike by 0 0.5, and then it starts to decay back, to a, back towards one again. So for the next spike, it takes a little bit longer before it reaches the point where it crosses VT, but it does again, and so on and so forth. And you can see here that the time between spikes is getting longer. So this is a very like, extremely simple model of an adapting neuron. Basically, each time it fires a spike, it takes a little bit longer uh, to, to drive it to, to spike the next time. So I'm hoping that this is basically um, trying to give you some idea that, uh, that this equation-based approach can be, can be very flexible to define sort of uh, arbitrary models. Okay, uh, any questions, Marcel? Otherwise I can just continue. Uh, for now, I think everyone's, everyone's, everyone's good. good. Cool. All right, uh, what do I have next on my list? Um, okay, right, so for the moment you can see where the spikes are happening, um, but we don't actually have any way of like listing that information. So now let's, uh, let's, um, all Let's, right, maybe, sorry, one, one thing, someone asked a question about uh, the state monitor, why you didn't use one state monitor to record the two things. Yes, I uh, and I think Yeah, I think you only did it because Brian Plot wouldn't work with it. Exactly, yeah. So Brian Plot can only do one. So maybe I should show that. Let's, let me just show that, yeah. So I can record both variables with a single state monitor. I just give the list of variables, or tuple in this case, that I want to record. Right, so now I'm recording V and VT. Uh, but uh, as Marcel says, um, Brian plot only works with uh, a single variable. Um, and that actually makes sense because in this case, V and VT can be plotted on the same axis, but in general, uh, it wouldn't be the case that two variables should or could be plotted meaningfully on the same axis. They may not even have the same units. Um, so it, it, Brian plot shouldn't, shouldn't be able to do that, actually. Um, in this case, we need to plot it by hand, uh, but we can do that. So we can plot V and uh, and VT like that. And that will work perfectly fine. Yep. Okay. All right. So yeah, I'll delete that in that case. All right, so now if we want to record the spikes that are happening, we, instead of recording the states, we're now recording the spikes. So it's called spike monitor. Uh, and we're recording from G and that we don't have to specify any options there. It just records all the spikes that comes out of the neuron of out of the group G. Okay, so let's uh, let's plot both here. Subplot. Just get the direction right. I'll explain this in a second. Uh, Something about 10 five should do it. All right, uh, just like a, a mini lesson on, uh, on matplotlib. This uh, is gonna create a new figure object. We didn't, by default, it just creates one of a sort of standard size. I'm gonna plot two graphs side by side. Um, so I want to specify the size of the figure 
to be uh, sort of 10 units across and five units down. Um, and then I'm dividing it into two subplots. Um, the first subplot is, is one, two, one. So basically uh, the, the one refers to number of plots down uh, and the two is referring to number of plots across. And then the one is which plot number. So it would be, this is plot one and this will be plot two. So subplot one, two, one refers to the left-hand side of the figure and subplot one to two will be the right-hand side of the figure. Uh, and then I'm gonna do a Brian plot on the spike monitor. And it's probably not going to be super meaningful because there's only one neuron. So it's going to show a raster plot, which has a dot at the time of each spike. So you can see here that this fires a spike, at whatever this is, a few milliseconds, and that's coming up here. Another time near 20 milliseconds, and that's coming up here, and so on. Right? So this is recording the, uh, the times. And, and we can also, for example, just print that. Um, we could print the times of the recorded spikes. So you can see it's there's one at 6.8 milliseconds, one at 18.7 milliseconds, and so on. Um, and again, uh, you can you can do this by hand. Uh, it, would, uh, it will, the two variables that spike monitor records are called T and I. I is the index of the neuron that fired. In this case, this isn't gonna be very helpful to know because we've only got one neuron, its index is zero. So it's just gonna be a whole bunch of zeros. It's the only the times that matters. But normally you have groups with multiple neurons in. So combining these two is gonna be helpful. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna get onto multiple neurons in a second, uh, but it's just one more thing that I want to show before we get to that, which is refractoriness. Um, could you copy the cell here? Um, yeah, which one? This one up here, I guess. Yeah, that should work. The, uh, the tabs might not come out quite right, but. <laughs> um, yeah, actually for future tutorials, that might be a good idea to have a method for everyone being able to copy and paste from what I'm you, doing. You can copy and paste it into the, the uh, etherpad. The... I could do, but then it gets a bit fiddly. So I'll leave it for the moment. <laughs> An automated system would be good. Um, cool, okay, I lost my train of thought. Oh yeah, refractoriness. Okay, so another thing that uh, real neurons do is um, after they fired a spike, they're typically refractory for some amount of time. And that means that they can't fire an, another spike. And so we can include that in Brian. We've got a special keyword for this, which is refractory. Um, let's make it really obvious what's going on by setting refractoriness to a really long time, five milliseconds, just because it will make it easier to see. That's sort of unrealistically long, but it'll let us see. Um, and I'm also gonna put here the keyword unless refractory. I'll explain that in just a second. First of all, let's just have a quick look at uh, what that does. So you can see the effect here, right? So I've made that the neuron should be refractory for five milliseconds. So after it fires a spike, it resets, and then it just stays at its value of zero for five milliseconds before it starts to, uh, starts to respond to the current and rise again. Okay, so, so that's how you do refractoriness, very easy. Now, what I've done here is I've written unless refractory in brackets afterwards. And what this means is that V should follow this differential equation unless V is in a refractory state. And if V is in a refractory state, it should just do nothing at all. Um, if I took that out, let's just delete that now, you can see that it more or less looks like what it did before. There is actually a difference, which is that for five milliseconds after this spike, it couldn't fire another spike. But in, as it happens in this particular case, it wouldn't fire another spike anyway. Uh, and we can see that, let's say if I put refractoriness up to 50 milliseconds, you can see what would happen here, which is that, so you can see here that this neuron fires a spike and it's now refractory for 50 milliseconds, but V is still following that differential equation, which means that V is still gonna be increasing to two. It's actually gonna cross the firing threshold, but it's not gonna fire a spike because it's refractory. Uh, and then the 50 milliseconds is up. Now V is above the, uh, above the threshold, so it can fire a spike. It fires a spike and resets again. So normally this is not what you want to do. You want to have the, the dynamics of the neuron shuts down um, while it's refractory. 
but you may not want all of the dynamics to shut down, which is why we have this way of specifying it. So for example, you probably wouldn't want this to happen. Um, let's run that. So now the, the, the threshold will also stop changing while the neuron is refractory. That's probably not what you had in mind. Um, so, so that's how you specify this. Basically, you switch off the dynamics of, uh, of a differential equation by specifying in, in parentheses and less refractory afterwards. All right. Still stuck on changing the, the capital V to V. I'm sorry, but I, I just knew that I was going to make that mistake so many times if I didn't make that change now, because I always use little V. I don't know why I wrote big V. Um, <laughs> um, okay, all right, uh, let's run that one more time. Okay, oh, that refractory period is probably a bit long. Let's now drop that down to a more reasonable one millisecond. There we go. Um, someone gets a warning when using a less refractory, I'll let Marcel uh, look into that uh, rather than talk about that on the screen. Cool. Okay. All right. So now at this point, let's, let's start looking at, um, I'm, I'm going to copy and paste the code again. I can easily do that every now and again. Now let's start thinking about multiple neurons now. Let's first of all, let's just create, uh, instead of creating one neuron, let's create 100 neurons. Bam. Done. Okay. So already you can see that uh, we now have 100 neurons, but it's not very interesting because they're all doing exactly the same thing. Um, and also there's something going on here, which is that actually um, the state monitor is recording this for every single one of those 100 neurons. So that's wasting quite a lot of memory. Um, so let's, let's do a few things here. First of all, let's fix up this state monitor so that it just ref records a single one of the neurons. So it's only going to record neuron index zero. So we set that to record equals zero. It's only going to record neuron index zero. Okay, that's not going to change anything. Um, but now we're wasting less memory. What next? Let's make each neuron do something a little bit different. So what would be a good way to do that? Well, a very simple thing we could do is just have each neuron start off at a different random point. Um, and that's very easy to make that happen. So I can just write something like g.v equals rand. Okay, and there's, so, there's something to understand here. So first of all, I'm setting the value of, uh, to a string. Um, and when you set a value to a string in Brian, the way it interprets it is I should iterate over every single neuron and evaluate this for each neuron in turn. So the effect of this will be that each neuron um, will get a different random number between zero and one as its starting point. Okay, now let's run that. So there we go. We can already see now because they always start at a slightly different starting point. Um, we, uh, you know what? Let, let me let me uh, let me record two different neurons. I'll record neurons zero and one just to give the idea here, and I'll need to plot those as well. Um, is this going to work? It's either this or I have to transpose it. Let's see. I think I had to transpose it. Uh, uh, okay, these are actually very similar. Um, oh, maybe it's just because I am running for too long, or maybe if I run just for ten milliseconds, we'll be able to see the difference there. Yeah. Okay. Um, so here you can see we've got um, two different neurons. One starts at you know about 0.5, and the other starts at about. Uh, uh, whatever that is, 0.15, something like that. And so they proceed to spike at different times. Okay. All right. I'm going to go back to just recording one uh, neuron to simplify that. We'll go back to 100 milliseconds. Okay. So now you can see the effect is basically the pattern of spikes isn't going to change. It's only offset by a certain amount by where it started. Um, so you can see that when, when you've got a bunch of them that are appearing in this pattern, that's going to reproduce for all of the others. It's still very deterministic. 
Um, so someone is asking, can you specify differently for different neurons? Yes, that's a, that's a great thing to do next. Um, I will, let me, let, me, let me come back to that in a second. I've got a nice way of showing that, which I think will be clearer. Um, yeah, in fact, let's just go straight on to that now. So before I get onto that, I'm going to talk about um, specifying parameters. So, um, yeah, so someone is asking about conditional statements in equations. I wasn't planning to talk about that today. The answer is yes, you absolutely can. Um, let, let me come back to that in a second since someone's asked. But first of all, I'm going to talk about parameters. Um, so I'm going to define a parameter. Uh, I'll call it, um, actually, I'll just call it capital I. Uh, and here's how I specify a parameter. So a parameter basically is, is just a fixed number, right? It's, um, it doesn't have a differential equation. And the way I define that is in the list of equations, I just give a name and its unit. Now, this is basically, it's, a, it's a, just a variable that exists and is different for each neuron, but doesn't change over time unless you change it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this input current here to be I. Now, by default, this is uh, going to set that input current to, um, I'm going to switch that random initialization off. And I'm going to instead initialize I um, in some way. So I could initialize I as a random number. Um, and maybe that's worth seeing. Uh, no, let's, let's, let's go straight to, so someone asked, can it be different for each neuron? So let's do that. So I'm gonna say rand times i divided by, uh, let's say 1.0 times n. Um, let's make that a bit bigger as well, uh, three. So what is this gonna do? Uh, basically, i here, in these strings refers to the index of the neuron. Um, so this number will be zero for neuron zero, five for neuron five, right up to, we've got uh, 100, um, up to um, just, just less than, uh, up to 99, right? Um, and so basically the value that each neuron is gonna get is gonna be slightly different. The lowest neuron uh, the lowest uh, indexed neuron is going to get an input current of zero, and the highest one is going to get three times. Uh, actually, I'm just going to remove this round. Uh, that's, uh, that's just complicated things. It's going it's to get the value three. Okay. Um, and now, if we run that, we should see the effect of that. Yes. So, again, we were plotting neuron zero here. Um, oh, right, what is n? So n is a built-in variable that is the number of neurons in the group. Yeah, um, sorry, I should have said that. So we have a few like built-in special names that, that are a bit context dependent. I think that there's a table, is that right, uh, Marcel, in our documentation, which gives all the lists of all those special names? Maybe you could- Yeah, it's, that in. Uh, yeah. I, can, I can put a link to the documentation in the, in the chat. Yeah. But basically it's things like IJ for indices. Uh, N is typically number of neurons or synapse or something like that. So there's a, there's a fairly sort of consistent. Um, yeah, you shouldn't use N in equations. That's right. Um, Marcel, what happens when you try and use N in equations? It's actually causing an error. error. It does cause an error. Yeah, okay, good. It doesn't try and uh, overwrite that. Cool, okay, so all right, so, so now, all right, so this is plotting neuron zero, and so the current here is zero, so of course it doesn't fire a spike, and you can see that down here that the, the lower neurons, or neurons with an index actually below 30, are gonna have an input current that isn't higher than one, so they're not gonna fire a spike. So anything with an index lower than 30, it won't fire a spike. And as you go up, the input current is getting larger and larger, so they're firing the spike earlier and earlier. Um, so we can we can demonstrate that. Let's record neuron uh, 35, say. You can see that neuron 35 is only just about firing a spike. It just fires one spike. Whereas if we record from neuron 95, uh, you can see uh, it's got a much higher input current and so it's firing lots and lots of spikes. Okay. Um, cool. 
All right, so that's how you uh, specify things with a different value for each. Uh, so someone is asking, uh, is compatible C style? No, so the, the strings should be written in Python syntax. Uh, so when Brian generates C code, it, it converts from Python syntax into C syntax. So it'll handle that for you. Everything should be in uh, Python syntax. Yep. Okay. Um, so does that answer, someone asked a question earlier, does that answer that question that came earlier about uh, could it be different for each neuron? Um, I think that's, I think that probably fully answers that question. Is there a way to get a specific neuron that fires the spike? I don't fully understand that question. Do you, do you want to list the neurons that fired the spike? So maybe if I, if I show that now, it's more, it's more interesting, right? Um, so now these are the times of the spikes and there's a corresponding which index of which neuron fired the spike down here. Um, so um, maybe it's easier to look at some specific examples. Um, So in this case, the fifth spike recorded was at 4.3 milliseconds and it was uh, neuron number 94 that fired that spike. Yeah. But now I can show you actually how this plot on the right hand is, is done. If you want to do it without Brian plot, it's actually a very simple plot. It's um, on the X axis, it's the time of the spike in milliseconds. And on the Y axis, it's the index of the spike. Um, and you just want to plot a dot for each one. Why didn't that work? Oh, because it was the wrong, it was, it's SPM for the spike monitor. There we go. So that's what it is. Good, good, good. Marcel, do you, are there any other questions I should be answering at this point? Or should I move on? I think for now, looking good i don't see any any open questions i mean there's still still plenty of open questions but they're a bit more uh, synapses and other somewhat advanced topics okay all right so i'm going to make a copy of that cell and start a new one and i will also paste that code in here for everyone uh, i'm going to simplify things a little bit here just to show the the next bit um, I, ah, no, I'll continue. I'll continue. I'll, I'll, I'll work it out somehow. All right. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to throw in stochasticity in here because that's often something that you want to include in neurons. You want to include some noise term. You want your neuron to be driven by noise. And that's something you can also uh, model in Brian. And here's uh, one way of doing that. So I can write 0 0.5 times psi times tau. This is going to look a bit mystical, but I'll explain some of it. Okay. Um, so XI is another special built-in name, and it essentially refers to um, more or less uh, Gaussian white noise um, with uh, a, a, a zero mean and a, a variance of one. Um, strictly speaking, it defines a stochastic differential equation where psi is, um, what is it called again? It's a stochastic differential. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of theory about, about this. But basically, you can't just insert random numbers here because it has to scale differently depending on the time constant at which you simulate it. And if you specify it like this, we deal with that for you. You don't need to worry. It has a weird feature, which is that the units of xi, of xi, are uh, square root of um, one over the square root of time. Um, there is a, an explanation, I think, on the Brian documentation about this that I will let you go and read. But the key thing basically is if, if your time constant is tau, so you're dividing by tau, you just want to be dividing by the square root of tau if you've got the noise term here instead. Uh, and that's what, what's happening here, by the way, because I'm multiplying by tau to the power of, uh, star star is Python notation of to the power of uh, minus 0 0.5. So that's dividing by the square root of tau. Uh, and this is just a constant, 0 0.5. Okay. And if I run that, we should probably see the effect. Yes. Here we go. 
you can see that what was nice uh, clean um, traces before is now varying a little bit stochastically. Um, and I can change that constant to change that amount of noise. So let's make that 0 0.1, 0 0.1, for example. Now you can barely see the noise at all. Um, let's boost that up to 0 0.05. You can start to see some of the effect of the noise. Uh, make that as much as 0 0.2. The effect of the noise is getting stronger and stronger. Uh, and now let's... Uh, boost that noise very high indeed and now you can see it's almost entirely dominated by the noise okay so that's how you that and, and like i say that there is a, a page in the brian documentation maybe marcel can paste it that'll explain a little bit more about stochastic differential equations uh because there's there's some theory there and i don't want to get too much uh, bogged down into that right now cool all right um so I'm, I'm done more or less with showing what I was going to show about neurons with no synapses. Um, so if you like, I can take, we can take maybe a five minute break at this point would be good for everyone. You can have a little tinker around with that. Um, and we'll, uh, we can, we'll still be here to answer questions uh, in the chat. Um, and we'll come back in five minutes. Yep. So that's at 3.30 in my, in my clock. We'll start the next little bit. Cool. Yep, great.
Okay, I'm back. Can everyone confirm that my video and audio is coming through again? All good. All good, cool. Um, yeah, so there's um, there's quite a cool little uh, thing that someone has pasted for sharing code online that updates as you type. I might try that next time. Um, we'll see. For the moment, um, that uh, that Dropbox is now accessible and hopefully will update. Um, while uh, while the tutorial goes along. Cool, and there are some other questions. Someone asked a question, right, about magic error. Um, yeah, I can kind of explain the magic error thing. So the issue here is that the way Brian works is when you run, it has to decide which objects that have been created are should be included in that run. And for example, if, you had, if I had two cells here and I created a neuron group up here and another neuron group down here, um, this run function wouldn't know that those two things had been created in different cells because there's no way for, for it to know that. Um, and it also it shouldn't be something that only works for Jupyter Notebooks. So what it does is it basically more or less just includes everything that has been created um, in the run. Uh, and it creates what's called a, a magic network, which does that. Um, so I can probably show you show you that if I type in magic network. Mm. How how can I show the magic network, Marcel? Um, you want to get a get the arrow? You mean? No, or? just just show them what what uh, what what's in the magic network object, basically. Uh, actually, that's tricky because uh, it doesn't doesn't store it. It's only during the run it collects uh, everything. Okay. Uh, but you can use the collect function, which um, oh, simulates okay. what it does. Okay. Well, I'll tell you. What, I'll just show you about network because it's, it's a it's a useful thing to know about. So, what happens internally is that it creates uh, a, a magic network, uh, fills it up with some objects, and then calls net dot run on that. Um, a network is something you can create yourself if you want to have control over what is and what isn't run. Um, so. A network is basically just a collection of objects that should be run. So in this case, what we want to run is the object G, the neuron group, the state monitor, and the spike monitor. Those are all of the objects that ought to be included in the simulation. And then we run that for 100 milliseconds. So if I run that, it does exactly the same thing, but now I'm not using the magic system. So the magic system basically just automates the process of creating these network objects and running those network objects. But in, in the case of a Jupyter notebook, that will occasionally cause problems because you'll have leftover variables and, and that, might, uh, that might mess things up. Um, so yeah, so basically start scope is there to help with that. It says, hey, magic functions, ignore everything that has been created up until this point. The only things that you should care about are things that uh, happen after this point. Uh, it's basically like forget in terms of the magic functions, everything that has previously existed. So that's what putting the start scope at the beginning of the cell does. Okay, and I'll delete that now and just leave it uh, with the run. All right, actually I'll, I'll leave that in, then it's there for the, the saved version. Okay, so now I think we're gonna talk about uh, synapses next. <clears throat> um, all right, so let's just start with uh, the simplest possible uh, thing we can do with the synapse. Actually. Yep, okay, I'm gonna start a new cell here and I'm gonna make a neuron group that is, is very boring. Uh, it's gonna have two neurons and it's going to have, mm, Let's give it the same equation. Let's give it the standard leaky integrate and fire. Uh, and this time I'm going to make the time constant be specified in the equation just to make it a little bit different. So before I had a tau here, but this time I've just written 10 milliseconds directly into the equation. That works just as well. Uh, it's going to follow the same equations. I'm not going to have it do any spiking for the moment just to see what's going on. Um, Yep, okay. Um, yeah, no, let's, let's have it spiking actually. 
otherwise it's going to be difficult to see what's going on indeed. Okay, and I'm going to make uh, v two and zero. Oh no, let's not do it that way. Um, I know what we'll do. Okay, we'll have an input current and we'll set that input current to be two and zero. And we will monitor the value of V for everything. We'll run it for a hundred milliseconds and we will plot that at the end. Let's see if that works. Yep, good, good. Okay, probably more spikes than I want right now. So let's just slow that down a bit. Okay, yeah, there we go. All right, so what you see here is that neuron zero is this blue curve and it has an I of 1.5. So it's being driven to spike. Neuron uh, index one is the orange curve. That's the membrane potential of uh, neuron index one. And it has an I of zero, uh, an input current of zero. So it's not gonna spike on its own. Okay, so that's basically just to, to get things set up. What we're going to now create is we're going to create a synapse from uh, neuron index zero to neuron index one. So that each time this fires, you should see something happen in this trace down here. Okay, let's do that. So to do that, we create a synapses object. So synapses object takes arguments, the source neuron group, that's where the synapses are coming from and argument the target neuron group. That's where the synapses are going to. Now, in this case, they're both the same, right? It's a, it's a recurrent connectivity. The group connects neurons in itself to itself, uh, but they can be different. So if you had two different neuron groups, you could um, have synapses connect from one group of neurons to a different group of neurons. Okay, um, and that's all that we're gonna do for now. Um, and I'm going to connect neuron index i equals zero to neuron index j equals one. So what does that mean? It means that, so i and j here are the source neuron index and the target neuron index. So if I say that uh, the source neuron is index zero and the target uh, neuron is index one, that's basically creating a synapse from neuron zero to neuron one. That's what this has done. Um, okay, so let's see what happens when we run this. Answer is nothing at all, because we haven't actually said what that synapse does. And at the moment, it doesn't do anything at all. So let's make it actually do something. And the way we do that is we create code for what happens on a, a presynaptic event. And so the code for that is on pre. So basically, you're, th you're thinking of, you're reading this as saying, on, so as in like, if, a, if that happens, on a presynaptic event, that's a pre, um, do the following. And what we want to do is we want to increase V by, let's say 0 0.5. Yep. So basically what will happen now is when neuron zero fires a spike, in the space of neuron one, the value V will be increased by 0 0.5. Okay, so now if I run this, we should see the effect of that. And there we go. It does, it does what I said. When neuron zero fires a spike, uh, neuron one is increased by 0 0.5 and then it starts to decay. And then neuron zero fires a spike again, it's increased by 0 0.5, it starts to decay and so on. In this case, it's not quite enough to make uh, neuron one uh, actually fire a spike itself, but that's fine. You can, you can see the effect of that. Okay, um, that was quite a lot of uh, code and concepts I just threw at you there. So is there, is there any questions that anyone wants to, uh, to ask based on that so far? There were some people having trouble, but I think someone else pasted the code now and that uh, hopefully fixes that. Well, there are a number of questions around how you can define specific 
types of uh, connectivity, especially to people ask about having um, connectivity matrices, but I'm not sure whether you want to go into that right now. Or... I'm, I'm going to get to connectivity matrices and stuff like that a bit later. So we, we can come back to that. Uh, for right. the moment, let's just let's just do defining what the neuron model is. Yeah. Uh, also, someone asked, is RAND uh, random normal or random uniform? RAND is uniform. RAND N is uh, normal. OK, um, great. OK, so hopefully everyone understands now what's going on in this example. Uh, now, in this case, I've hard coded a weight. The neuron weight is 0 0.5, essentially. Um, or oh, someone's asking, it would V as V plus 0 0.5 would work? Yes, it would work. Does the same thing. And you can also have multiple lines here. Um, well, I mean, just stupidly, let's do that. So I'm increasing it by 0 0.5 and then I'm increasing it by another 0 0.2. So it's the same as doing it at 0.7, but just to demonstrate the point, you can have multiple lines. In this case, I've separated them by a semicolon. Uh, but you could also write a multi-line string here. Um, and that works as well. Yep. Uh, conditionals is a bit more complicated. Uh, I think we'll we'll leave that for uh, an, an advanced version of the uh, of the tutorial. You can do some stuff that's conditional, but it's a bit uh, it's a bit more complicated. Okay, let's simplify that back to what it was. V plus equals zero point five. Okay, um, now let's change that. Now, what we probably want is uh, a weight, uh, a weight. Let's call it W. That is different for each synapse. So at the moment we haven't defined W anyway. This is going to cause an error. Um, and what we want is that it to be defined for each synapse. So what we do is we create a set of equations for the synapses exactly the same as we do for the neurons. In fact, actually synapses is, is a class that's actually derived from neuron group, I think, or just from group, which, anyway, it's, it's kind of the same, right? Um, so what I'm gonna do is in a string, I can define a, a set of differential equations if I want for each uh, synapse variable. But in this case, I'm just gonna create um, a variable W, which is a parameter. So there'll be one value of W, for each synapse, uh, and it won't do anything. It's just a, a fixed value. Um, and so I'm going to need to set those values of W. If I set that to 0.5, uh, oh, probably ought to have put a comma after there. That's going to do the same thing. OK. Oh, right, yeah, the method thing. Uh, There we go. Um, right, okay. So now there's a value of W for each synapse um, and, and, and we can specify it uh, like that. Um, I'll come back to things that we can do with that in a second, but uh, let's just leave that for a moment and just show you a couple of other things that you can do. So one thing you can do is you can have delays. So let's say that all synapses should have a five millisecond delay. So we just write synapses.delay is five milliseconds. Now we run that, and now you can see that the effect of this spike at this time, so the remember zero, neuron zero fires here at this time, doesn't occur on the target neuron until five milliseconds later. Yep. Um, and this is just a standard variable that is, always exists. It's a default name delay. Uh, I think you can actually overwrite that, but that's advanced stuff that we won't get into right now. Um, yeah. Okay, doke. Um, questions, anyone? Any questions on that? Otherwise, I will start talking a bit about connectivity, I think. Could we actually have an exponential decay for the synapse instead yeah. of just a step? And then what would be the argument name for that third uh, input? It depends what you're, you're, you're meaning here. Do you want to do, um, do you want to, um, 
have like a sort of slight, a slow acting synapse or something like that. Um, so that rather than an instantaneous change like that, it will, you know, create a sort of... A or maybe like, a, like that. a synapse that actually is a, a, an input current, which is actually exponentially decaying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me, let me show you the sort of standard way that we would do that. So we would do something like, you actually create a new uh, neuron variable, um, which I'll call X. Um, and we give that a time constant as well. Let's say that's five milliseconds. Um, so X basically is, is acting as a, a current into this. Um, and now what we're gonna say is instead of directly increasing V, we directly increase X. So X is gonna increase by 0 0.5. And hopefully we should see the effect of that. No, I made a mistake. Oh yeah, units. Okay, uh, and so now you can kind of see the effect here, which is that instead of having an instantaneous jump in V, X has an instantaneous jump, but that only affects V uh, relatively slowly. Um, maybe I, let, me, let me show you the, the PSP for that, which I can do by basically uh, setting a very, very long refractory period. So that it can only fire one spike, just to demonstrate the point. Yeah, so this fires its spike and now uh, you can see the PSP that that's created. I think that's probably what you were what you were asking there. Yeah, exactly. Thank yep. you. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah. So I'll just I'll just delete that for the moment because I want to just keep things simple. Um, so we'll go back to what I had before. Yep. Cool. Um, Marcel, were there any other questions? There was a question about setting the delays differently for for each uh, each of the synapses. If yes. So in your case, you only have one. So. Yeah, I'm I'm going to get to that in a second when I've got more more synapses, basically. So yes, I will come right back to that. Um, yeah. So to get to that, I'm going to create a new example, uh, a new cell. Uh, in this case, we're actually going to have. Okay, here's a weird thing. We're going to have a hundred neurons. And there's going to have no variables whatsoever. Um, so that's how you create a hundred absolutely pointless variables that have no state, uh, can't fire uh, spikes or do anything. Um, but it works. Uh, I'm just doing that basically as a placeholder so I can create a synapse. Um, and because there's no, there's going to be any spikes, I don't actually need to uh, create anything that those synapses do. Um, uh, let's delete that for the moment. Delete that. In fact, we're not even going to need to run any of that. Um, all right. So let's start off by plotting uh, uh, the previous example. So remember, I'm still connecting neuron zero to neuron one. And if we do a Brian plot, what we see here is uh, it's a little bit weird. But basically, on the on this this is a, a sort of image plot. On the x-axis is the source neuron index and on the y-axis is the target neuron index and there is only one synapse and it's source neuron zero, target neuron one. So that's why this blue blob is here. That's the only synapse that exists. Okay, that's not very interesting. Let's create um, a more interesting connectivity pattern. And I'll start off by talking about the condition connectivity pattern. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect neurons I and J. So source neuron I, remember, target neuron J. First of all, um, we have to have the I is not equal to J. I don't want self-connections. But I'm also going to say that I and J shouldn't be too far apart from each other. So the absolute value of I minus J has to be less than 10. So, um, and now I can, I can pl plot, this, uh, plot this synapse. And here we go. You can see here, um, this is the source neuron uh, index, target neuron index, and you can see that along the diagonal, there's zeros. Uh, there's no, there's no uh, synapses connecting those. Off the diagonals, there are synapses until you get too far, until you get 10 neurons away uh, from the diagonal, and then there are zero synapses again. All right. Um, now, okay, 
maybe I'll, I'll have a quick pause to see if anyone has a question based on that. Uh, and also just to have a let you have a little look at that and think about that. No, that's good. Okay. All right. Um, so let's let's uh, let's make that a little bit wider. There we go. Lots of synaptic connectivity. And I can kind of write anything I like in here, right? So basically all of this has to be is a, a sort of mathematically reasonable expression in a Python syntax um, that evaluates to a Boolean, right? So that's a Boolean expression. That's a Boolean expression. I've connected them with an AND. So this thing returns a Boolean value uh, and it tells me whether or not to create a synapse between I and J or not. Um, Okay, so, and we can combine various different ways of creating synapses. So um, let's do another type of connectivity. Um, now I'm gonna say P is 0 0.5. Uh, what this is gonna do is every synapse, uh, every pair of uh, neurons will be connected with a probability of 0 0.5. Let me run that randomly. And there we go. Basically here, it's just some sort of random noise. Each pair, it's randomly chooses uh, uh, with probability 0.5, whether to connect them or not. There we go. Um, and we can combine these. So I can take the previous condition and add the probability on top of that as well. So now this condition has to hold and this probability is done on top of that. So there we go. It, uh, for each neuron that satisfies this condition, it connects them with a probability of 0 0.5. So there still won't be any connections along the diagonal or further off the diagonal than uh, 30 apart, uh, but not every one that satisfies that condition will have one, only about half of them. Um, and probabilities can also be specified with a string. So let's do that. Let's say now, um, Let's say that the probability of a synapse between I and J is, uh, let's make it a sort of Gaussian sort of a shape, uh, something like that. I've probably made a mistake, let's see. Uh, divides two integer values, okay. Let's get rid of that warning, there we go, okay. So now the probability of a synapse is very high between uh, two neurons that are close and it's lower at the further you get away. And that's the sort of connectivity you might start thinking about being a bit more realistic. In this case, we're allowing self-connections. So suppose that we didn't want self-connections, we could keep the i not equal to j and otherwise have it be determined by that uh, probability. So there we go. No self-connections, but nearby neurons more likely to receive a synapse between them than, than distant ones. Yes, someone's saying, yeah, distance here is distance between the indices of the neurons. Now, actually, there's some fun stuff you can do with that. You could, if you want to, um, give the neurons a position. So let's suppose that I give, uh, let's put equations here now, because I'm going to start putting those back. Let's say that each uh, neuron has a one-dimensional position, right? It's uh, meter is like the, just the, the unit of position, right? And I'm gonna initialize those so that they are, let's say what, 20 nanometers apart, something like that. Um, micrometers apart, sorry. Um, okay, so basically the, position of neuron i of neuron zero is zero micrometers, the position of neuron one is 20 micrometers, of neuron two is 40 micrometers and so on. Um, I can now say um, that this probability should be a function of the, uh, of those positions instead. Uh, and there's a good chance I'm gonna make a, a mistake in doing this but let's give it a go. So what we want is we want the position of the source neuron. Um, is that right, Marcel? It's underscore pre and underscore uh, It's post. pre and post, right. Yeah. Yeah. And that is the position of the postsynaptic neuron. 
Um, and now I'm going to have to make that um, 30 micrometers. Is UM defined, Marcel? Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. Uh, and all right, that, that would be a very local, let's say, 200 micrometers squared. Okay. I wonder if this is going to work or if I've made a mistake. Let's see. Yeah, that works. Okay, so what's going on here? So, all right, so I explained what's going on here. Each neuron has a, a variable X that defines its position. Um, and the synapse, from the synapse point of view, X on its own wouldn't have any meaning because it could refer to the presynaptic neuron or it could refer to the postsynaptic neuron. And when there's a doubt about that, you have to specify whether you mean pre or postsynaptic by writing underscore pre or underscore post. So here, the difference between the presynaptic and postsynaptic neuron position uh, is the is the determinant in this uh, in this exponential uh, in this in this um, sort of Gaussian uh, hat shape. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, so next, next. Um, all right. We can throw in some weights in here just to show that you can also um, initialize some weights. So let's say that each neuron has a weight, uh, a weight W. Um, and we can set those weights. And someone said, can you set the weights differently? So yes, indeed, you can. Um, I'll widen that a bit first. Let me just have a quick look to see if that's generating enough neurons. Yeah, okay, that's plenty, plenty of synapses. Um, oops. So now I'm going to initialize those weights also as a function of, um, of i and j or of x. Um, let's, let's make it something a bit fun. Let's make it one plus sine two times pi times f. L, yeah, uh, x pre. So f now has to have units of one over distance and uh, Let's see if that works. And now I'm going to plot those weights. Okay, let's see if I, I've made something that works here or not. Yes, indeed. So what you can see now is, first of all, the, the, the white cells are more or less the same as before, right? So the connectivity pattern is defined by this equation up here. It's about the difference in the positions of those neurons. But the weights of the neurons is also a function of something. In this case, it's only a function of the position of the source neuron. Uh, and it's basically a, a, a spatial sine wave. Um, so here you see W goes from zero up to two. Uh, when it's yellow, it's two. And when it's dark blue, it's zero. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and there you can see it's got a, a frequency of about uh, 200 micrometers. Yep. Cool. Okay. Um, any other questions on that, Marcel? There are a number of questions or a number of people ask about how you can get a weight matrix to specify the connections or also the other way around. How can you get a weight matrix out of, out of things? Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, let's start off with getting a weight matrix out. Um, so uh, do, we, do we have a built-in method for that, Marcel, or should I do it by hand? Uh, you have to do it by hand. There's no, no method for that, uh, no even method. though I think we, we talk about it in the documentation explicit, but yeah, there's a number of steps you have to do. Okay, so uh, I'm going to make a uh, 100 by 100 matrix that's going to store the weights. Um, and if I want to uh, initialize that, I'm basically going to say that uh, s dot i, s dot j is s dot w. Do I have to put a colon here, Marcelo? Uh, 
Uh, it should work like this as well, but should uh, it work like that? Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's see if that worked. Yep. And let's make it display in the same way. Okay. So basically, what I've done here is I've created uh, a matrix of zeros that has uh, 100 by 100, right? So this zeros is, uh, is just NumPy. Uh, so I created a 100 by 100 uh, matrix of zeros. And what I've said is that, so the synapse object has an i and a j variable. And the i and the j variables are basically an array of uh, because they're sparse, the, 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 the synaptic structure is sparse, right? So it doesn't bother storing anything um, for positions where there is no synapse. Um, so what it does is it has an array i and an array j, which tell you the corresponding uh, location of the synapse in terms of source neuron and source index, um, and the corresponding array for w, which is the weight values for those same ones. So what I'm doing here is in a vectorized way, I'm saying for every um, uh, index in this array, index zero in this array corresponding to a source neuron and index one in this, uh, in this array corresponding to a target neuron, I'm placing the corresponding weight. Uh, and then imshow just uh, shows a matrix as an image. Uh, and you can see it's, uh, it's the same thing. Uh, well, it's upside down because image show is, puts the zero at the top left rather than the bottom left. Okay, I don't know how, yeah, origin equals lower, we'll fix that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so that's how you could convert a, uh, a matrix into, uh, sorry, uh, a synapses into a matrix. Um, what's, uh, Marcel, what's the obvious way of doing it the other way around? Uh, do we have something built in for that, or again, would I just? Uh, you, you, you'll have to do it manually as well. Um, but the the kind of obvious way would be you can take, for example, this. Uh, I mean, there's a weight matrix, but uh, the weights are zero if there's nothing. But you can use a non-zero on this matrix, and this will give you the i and the j's you need so that you can then plug into into the connect function. Something like this. Yes, something like this should Let's do it, see. I think. Yeah. Okay, yeah, all right, so that's giving me the, the non-zero, and then what would I do, flatten on W? Yeah, something like that. And then how would I initialize S, something like S, I, J, dot W, equals w or something like that no it's um, gonna be more complicated than that isn't it i'm gonna to have to do s dot connect i equals i j equals j and then s dot w equals w right. i think like if that. i remember correctly w dot flatten is actually uh in in the in the right shape to to just plug it in like that yeah um, i think this should work um let me i'm going to paste the link to the to our documentation where we talk about exactly that. Shouldn't you do w dot non zero dot flatten? Ah, yes. Right. Good, good point. <laughs> uh, oh, actually, it's w. It would be w i j just actually, wouldn't it? That's how it should be. That should. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. You only want the the non zero entries. Yeah. Um, let me. I'm, I'm. I'm confused myself. Okay. Uh, doop, doop, doop. I think this is right. Right. Um, yeah. It sounds, sounds. Looks good to me. I won't actually run that code. Okay. All right. So, so that's uh, something about how you can connect, convert into, into, and from a matrix. Yeah. Um, okay, if there was no other questions, I will briefly show the generator syntax because I think that's quite cool. Um, so we have one other way of, so, all right, so what's nice about this is it lets you write these expressions in a very uh, sort of, 
um, logical way, which is maybe the way that you think about it. But the downside of it is that to evaluate a condition, you have to evaluate it for every pair i and j. Uh, it's fine if you've got 100 neurons, there's only 10,000 things to evaluate. But suppose you had a million neurons connected to another million neurons, you've now got, uh, uh, well, depending if we're talking about sort of English millions and billions. But anyway, you've got a lot, you've got a hell of a lot of synapses you'll have to connect. So you can instead use this generator syntax, which tells you explicitly um, which neurons to connect to which. So here's how we would do that. We would write uh, something like k for k in range, let's say i minus 30 to i plus 30. And I'm going to put this skip if invalid equals true. I'll explain that in a second, but ignore just for the moment. Uh, and let's not bother with, oh, we can just leave that on, why not? Uh, oh, lots of warnings because I created a variable called i and j and w. Okay, if I run that again, I think those warnings should, ah, they don't go away. Uh, hang on a sec, let me just delete those. Okay, all right. So, all right, let me explain a little bit first. For, for, first of all, the, the weights that you see are just as it was before, right? It's the spatial sine wave. Um, now, what have I done here? So what I said is that the J variable should be defined by this string. And this string is basically a Python uh, generator string. Uh, so if you've seen that before, uh, you'll be able to just read this straight away. If not, uh, it can do an explanation. Um, basically, it says that, that J will have the value K where K goes through this loop. Uh, so it goes from i minus 30 up to i plus 30. That's what range does in Python. Uh, and then we just put that k value. So basically, j will just be all of the values from i minus 30 to i plus 30 um, for, for each neuron uh, i, we do that. And the advantage of doing it this way is that we don't bother creating any neurons that, um, that don't exist, essentially. Uh, it's a list comprehension, exactly right, yeah. Um, so yeah, I should have said list comprehension rather than generator syntax. It's, uh, it's a list comprehension is what I mean. Okay, so uh, the only slight thing here is that sometimes this will create indices of neurons which don't exist, right? Um, so for example, if i equals zero, then this k will go from minus 30 to plus 30, but there is no index minus 30, so that would raise an error. Uh, and the way we fix that is we have this skip if invalid equals true. Um, so basically it just, uh, it just won't create it if, uh, if that index that would be created were to be invalid. Okay, and again, you can write what you like. So um, I could write, uh, I don't know, uh, well, whatever, k squared. We're not going to do anything very meaningful. Uh, uh, all right, because it's going to it's going to have some repeats in it. Ah, okay, I know why. There we go. It's not very meaningful, but you could put that in. And again, you can write what you like here. And this is basically just another syntax that might be useful depending on what you're planning to do. Okay. All right. Um, and I've talked about initial values with the string. So I think that's more or less everything that I was gonna say about uh, synapses. Um, how are we doing for time? We're uh, two hours, 10 minutes in. And I was planning to do another 20 minutes before switching to the project. So I think we have time to do the last thing that I was gonna talk about in the tutorial, but I'm basically more or less done with synapses now. So if anyone wants to ask any more synapses questions, uh, maybe now is a good time to do that. The next, the next bit is quite short. It should only take 10, 15 minutes. So we have a few minutes to, uh, to talk about synapses.
And that's a question in the chat by Sadiq. What if the weights are modeled as an equation and it differs for each synapse? Um, I don't quite get it. Is, is the question about if you're having different types of synapses maybe? Maybe we can. Yes, uh, I think you get that right. If you have different types of synapses, you need to create multiple synapses objects, one for each type of synapse, um, oh, okay. which you can do. There's no problem right. to do that. Okay. But any individual synapses object, they will have to be the same type. They can have different parameters uh, and that can change their behavior quite a lot. Um, but uh, um, they have to have the same, uh, the same underlying equations. All right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Dean is asking a good question. So some synaptic plasticity rules like the triplet rule require that traces are updated in a certain order. Um, so yes, we can do all of that. Um, you can define the order in which every operation in Brian happens. Uh, it was, that's a little bit more advanced than I was planning to get into. Um, but briefly, I guess um, every object in Brian has a uh, a sort of um, a, a set of variables that defines its schedule in terms of when it gets updated in the in the loop, um, and I think it's when an order is that right? Yeah. So it has a when in this case for synapses it's at the start, and it has an order within that category. So of the things that happen in the start, it has order zero. So if you want to set it so that it, if you have two different synapses and you want first one set of synapses to happen and then the other, set its order value to one and it will do all of the ones with order zero first and then it will do all of the ones with order one. Uh, and you can also change when it happens within the loop. So basically you have things like start, um, before and after the uh, neurons are updated, before and after, blah, 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 things like that, and end. So there's a few, but there's a bunch of names and there's a page in our documentation about um, setting all of this stuff. But basically that's the idea is that you can do very fine gain control of when exactly every operation happens if you want to um, for those rules where it does matter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the question about delays being fixed during a run, I would like to change that. I think that would be really fun to do, but uh, it's just a matter of uh, spending the time to actually implement that at some point. Um, yeah. All right, okay, so I think I'm gonna, uh, I'll talk about, uh, if Marcel is not bringing up any other things, I'll talk a little bit about doing um, some fun stuff where it's like doing multiple runs and stuff like that. And uh, how was I gonna do that? I think some people missed the part about getting setting the connectivity from uh, the the no sorry the the weights from a from a matrix. Not sure what a, but it should be. I, I, I pasted a link to the documentation. documentation. Yeah, should have it. Do, do you want to repaste that in again? So that people don't have to. Keep yeah, let to me find it. let me find it again. Oop. Uh, I think it's up this one. Yeah, there we go. Up. This should have the two ways of getting from a matrix to connections and from connections to a matrix. Cool. Okay. All right. So I was going to talk about um, using store and restore. Okay. All right, so uh, let's try and come up with an example here. So one of the things you might want to do on a simulation is to do multiple runs across some set of parameters, say, and uh, see how things change as, as that happens. So um, uh, let's see. I'll st I'm starting again here. I'm gonna not have any synapses in this bit. Uh, negative here for tau. Create a single neuron with those equations. And let's say 
i minus phi. Okay, so now suppose you wanted to see how the number of spikes changed as a function of i. Um, one way you could do that would be this. You could say for i in, um, let's say, 0 to 20, 0 to 2, and we'll have 20 of them. So lin space is a bit of numpy. It says uh, create 20 values between 0 and 2. OK. So for i in i values, we could create those objects. Um, we can count the spikes, run it for 100 milliseconds, and end, end spikes, I think it's end spikes. And then we can plot that at the end. Okay, um, let's see if this works. This might cause problem but it might be okay let's see that's just a warning is it num spikes uh, yeah, and then we've got this problem of old and new variables start scope not num spikes either Marcel, is there a... It's num underscore spikes. Ah, num underscore spikes, okay. Okay, and now you can see it's it's running 20 simulations, each with just one neuron. Um, and I haven't specified the method, so we're getting this warning 20 times. And here we go. Here's the number of spikes as a function of i on the x-axis. Okay, so that would be one, one way you might imagine doing it. Um, but there are nicer things you can do. So let's first of all, we'll bring that start scope out. Let's define our whole simulation outside the uh, loop just once. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna store the state of the neuron at this time with this function store. So everything, the current state of the network will be stored in memory. And then at the beginning of each loop, we're gonna restore that. So basically, it takes a snapshot of the state of everything at this point in time, uh, and then it brings it re restores that snapshot in back into memory before running it for 100 milliseconds and doing the count. And in this case, something has changed, which is that this value of i is different on each on each uh, on each run. Okay, so this is basically going to do exactly the same thing, but it's um, it's still going to run the simulation 20 times, but. Um, it's a very nice way of doing it. It saves having to recreate all of these objects each time and, and putting the definition of the model in there. So this store and restore is quite, a, is quite a nice thing to know about. And it's a common use pattern. If you wanna put a sequence of stimuli into a network or something like that, you very often, or you want to do some training, you wanna store and then you wanna restore their previous values. So this store restore is quite a nice way of doing that. Um, Maybe just to add to that, an, an, another thing that you can do that that is not easy to do otherwise is to to run your network a bit before you do the first store. So to have some mm. like initialization period that you only want yeah. to do once, and then do the really interesting bit. Yeah, yeah. And so if I put that bit, if I put if I did the previous approach and I and I wanted to have this settling time at the beginning, I'd have to redo the same settling time over and over again, which would be uh, which would be very wasteful. Um, so you can create these snapshots and restore them at any point. Um, I think you, can you name snapshots as well, Marcel? You can yes, you can. Them. Yeah, so you can have multiple different snapshots with different names. Cool. Okay. Uh, and by the way, I should also say this is not the right way to do this. Um, if you want to do something like this, the correct way to do it is to vectorize it. Uh, and I should show you how you do that as well. The way to vectorize this is... Um, to do this, make i a parameter, make 
the number of neurons that are in your I values here um, and initialize that I parameter to those values and just run it once um, and plot the counts, the corresponding spike counts for those neurons. And it's going to do exactly the same thing, but it will run much quicker. There we go. Um, and I'm not going to talk a lot about making efficient Brian code, but the key thing about writing uh, efficient Brian code largely, the most important thing, is you want to minimize the number of Brian objects that there are. So you want if neurons are the, uh, if your neurons are the same, you want to group them together into a neuron group. You don't want to have one neuron group for each neuron. Um, similarly, if synapses are the same, you'd rather have a single synapse as object uh, rather than grouping them in, rather than having multiple synapse objects. Um, basically, because there's a slight cost essentially uh, per time step for each object that exists. Um, and so you reduce that cost uh, by having fewer groups. Okie doke. Um, and I have to do multiple runs with something changing via a loop. Okay. Do you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna also let's I'm just gonna show a couple of uh, another another randomly interesting thing here. Um, Poisson group. 100 neurons and firing 100 spikes per second. Okay, so Poisson group here is a uh, is a built-in um, uh, Brian object that has number of neurons and the firing rate of those neurons. Um, but I think uh, Marcel may correct me. G dot rates is just a standard Brian variable, right? It is, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I could do something like this. I could run it for 50 milliseconds and then change the firing rate to 50 hertz and then run it for oh, let's make it go higher and then run it for another 50 milliseconds and you'll see that indeed it fires fewer spikes in this first millisecond 50 milliseconds and then more spikes in the second 50 milliseconds so this is one of the ways in which you can set up simulations to, for example, you might want to run with no input for 100 milliseconds before putting an input in. Uh, and this is one of the ways that you can set that up. You can have multiple run calls and they stack. They, uh, you know, the, the next one continues from the start of the previous one. Okay. Um, now let's, all right. So we could do that with a loop. Um, let's have let's have that. So we're going to run it ten times, uh, and each time it's going to get a random firing rate. There we go. You can see the firing rate changing each time. So that's one way of doing it. Um, but there's other ways of doing that, um, which might be nicer. Um, for example, what you can do here is you can have a run regularly. And the way this works is you specify some code that's run on the group. Uh, oh, hang on, this is going to cause problems, right? Rates is defined as a parameter that's different for each neuron. Uh, oh, I didn't think about this in advance. Uh, okay, to do the thing that I wanted to do, I'm gonna slightly adapt this example. 
So Poisson Group is built in, um, but actually what it's doing is something that's very simple. It's basically a neuron group with 100 neurons um, with a rates variable, rates parameter, and with a threshold, which is that a randomly selected number has to be less than rates times dt. That's basically all that Poisson Group is doing. Um, so to explain that a little bit more, um, so this is the firing rate. It's potentially different for each neuron. Um, let me just write that out as a string here. That might make that a bit easier to understand. So each neuron has a, a variable uh, rates uh, with unit one over time. Um, and each time step for each neuron, Ryan will draw a random number between zero and one and check, is that random number smaller than rates times dt? dt is the, uh, the interval of time, right? It's uh, 0.1 milliseconds by default. It's the time step of the simulation. Uh, and so this is one way of generating uh, Poisson distributed spikes. Basically, this is an approximation for whether or not there's a single spike um, in an interval of width dt if the firing rate is rates. Okay, so all right, so that should do the same thing. Let's just check that it does. Yep, that does the same thing. Yeah, that's right. Um, the approximation basically is relying on the fact that dt is small enough that only one spike can occur. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, it's 0 0.1 milliseconds by default. That's a pretty good approximation, so it's okay. But yeah, indeed, if you're um, if you care a lot about getting the details of uh, Poisson distributed spikes very accurate and correct, you might indeed want to uh, generate them in a different way and think more carefully about how you do that. Uh, but this is not a bad approximation. Okay. Um, all right. And actually, this this is good. Actually, this lets me talk about something else. So let's put, suppose I put this in a string like this instead of the way I wrote it. Now, if I run this, you, um, are you, you're going to, okay, maybe uh, let's just have fewer of those so that we can see the effect more clearly as well. I'm going to remove the string for the moment. Let's just check that that looks nice and clear. Not as clear as I would have liked. Uh, maybe I need more neurons to make it clear. Too many. Sorry, I'm just trying to make it the, the structure of what's going on here nice and clear. I think it'll be clear if I plot it like that. Yeah, okay, that's nice and clear. Okay, uh, I just, I, I made it um, plot slightly differently to the way Brian plots it. I used uh, basically a smaller point for each spike and I've got more spikes. So now you can see the, uh, the bands of activity that happen every 50 milliseconds more clearly. Um, cool, okay. So that's doing what we want to, what we would expect. Now, suppose that I changed it to make a string like this. Those bands of activity are now gonna entirely uh, disappear. And the reason is that when I run it like this, this is evaluated in Python in NumPy and it just computes one number. And then it sets all of the neurons to have that same number as their firing rates. However, if I specify it as a string like this, now this rand is interpreted as run this individually for each neuron. So it draws a new random number um, for each neuron um, which means that you're not going to see this band of activity because each neuron basically has a different firing rate um, than all of the other ones. Um, so you won't see the, the clear pattern emerge in the same way. But we can fix that. Uh, and the way we fix that, and this is a nice thing to know, is that we can make this a shared variable. So a shared variable is one that instead of being different for each neuron is the same for every neuron in the group. And we declare something as being shared by just writing in parentheses shared afterwards. 
Okay. So now, now that we know that rates is a shared variable, the way that this is interpreted now is that it only, there's only a single value here. Um, and so this random number is generated now just once and shared between all of the neurons. So now if I run this, this time it's going to uh, restore the previous behavior. That, rate, though, that firing rate is now shared between all of those neurons. <clears throat> okay, I hope that was clear. I think there's maybe maybe a slight confusion about when you when you switch between um, r using rent in mm. uh, in the in the string and rent outside of the string because uh, I mean rent within strings it it adapts to the context. So in your first example, it it creates one value per each neuron, and now where rates is a shared variable. It only creates a, a single value. Yeah. But if you call it outside from from NumPy, just a standard rent function, uh, rent without arguments creates a single number. So the equivalent to to calling it as a string would rather be something like where rent, and then you put the length of the neuron group. If if, if it weren't a shared variable, yep. just uh, I'm not sure that's hundred percent clear for everyone. Yeah. So basically, if I write this in Python. It can't know about how that value is going to be used. So it's just going to create a single, a single number. And now, if you imagine that that string is not there, all that Python sees is the result of generating that number. Right? It sees some number, like whatever. Uh, and so it sets, and since it only is seeing one number, it sets all of the neurons to have that one number um, as the value of their rates. Whereas if it's in a string, it has now the context, which is that this is what you meant. What you meant is that everything should be a random number times 500 times hertz, and it evaluates that separately. Basically, the semantics is if, uh, if you set something with a string, it's evaluated separately for each neuron or for each synapse or for what, each whatever in, in the appropriate setting. Except that because I've now declared the variable rates as a shared variable, now there is only one value of rates. And so this will only be called once for that single value of rates. So actually now this restores the same as the same behavior uh, as we had before. Okay. I see more yeses than anything else in the participants. Is that clear response? So hopefully, uh, hopefully that was clear enough at least. Um, cool. All right. Uh, all right. So now we get to the point, which is what I wanted to get to, which is another way of doing this is to use something called run regularly. So now what we, what we write here is we write g.run regularly. Um, and we write rates is ran times 500 times hertz. And the idea here is that we're going to run this bit of code regularly. How regularly? We're going to run it every 50 milliseconds. Uh, and now we're going to run the whole simulation for 200 milliseconds to get the same behavior. And now this is going to do the same thing. Um, so basically, whereas previously we wrote uh, a loop and we called it four times, now we just run it once, but we specify that what's going to happen is that every 50 milliseconds, you're going to run this bit of code. Now, why would you do that? Well, one reason is that it's got less overheads like this. Um, this is basically one set, there's a certain amount of setup each time you call run. Uh, and if you're using code generation, that setup can be, uh, you know, 10, 20 seconds sometimes for a complicated network. So you want to minimize the number of run statements. So you want to put things into these run regularly. Um, the other reason is that if you're using the C++ standalone mode, you actually wouldn't be able to do this. It, uh, it can't convert arbitrary Python into C++, uh, so you would need to do this. But I think I'll talk about that if we do a, an advanced tutorial another time. Um, but there's other reasons that you might want to do this. <clears throat> okay, um, so that's one thing. And there is another option, which is to define something called a network operation. Um, and you may not have seen this notation. 
I will explain it. What, uh, what this means is it's called a uh, decorator in Python. So if you see at and then some name before a function, it's called a decorated function. And in the case of Brian, we've defined this decorator, uh, which means that what you should do is you should call this function every 50 milliseconds during the run of a, of a simulation. Okay. Um, and so that's exactly what happens. Basically, now this function will be called without arguments every 50 milliseconds. So this is going to do the same thing because what this function does is it sets the rates value to some random, random variable. Yeah. So um, basically here, it's, it's just a few different options. They will do the same thing um, of ways to control running a simulation where various things change during the simulation. Uh, and it's kind of good to know about all of those options because different ones are, are better in different situations. Okay, um, I think I'm actually done with the tutorial, um, 10 minutes over. Um, and I think we're gonna, I guess we'll probably have a break and then we'll do the projects. Um, Marcel, do you wanna say how you would like to do that? Unless there's any questions left. Um, I think question wise, we're good. Maybe I'm taking up some, if there, if there are some at the beginning of the project. Maybe, maybe one, one thing that I realized uh, uh, in parallel, I tried to run on the collab and indeed there, there's a problem there. And the problem um, seems to have to do with the SymPy version. And I, I didn't test it intensively, but I think if you ask for a specific SymPy version, which I just pasted in the, in the chat, so at this, exclamation mark pip, pip install simpy equals equals to 1.2 uh, to the to the installation for brian 2 tools and brian 2 it should work in collab and to be clear uh, you only need this when you're when you're working in the google collab and have problem with a brian brian uh, plot for for the other people don't please don't install an older version of simpy uh, if everything was working correctly um, yeah, for the for for the project, um, no one missed anything. We didn't we didn't uh, say anything about them yet. Um, I think I'll talk about it after a break. I think it's been a while since we didn't have one. So yeah. should we take maybe a, a ten minute break? So Let's take a ten minute break. Yeah. Back at wait, uh, British time it would be four fifty. Yeah. Right. Okay, let me let me maybe put this on a slide. This one for people. Okay, yeah, shall I stop sharing my screen then? Right, maybe. And oop. let's see how that works. And oop, oop. share screen. Oop. Does it look look good? What is BTC? Oh, isn't it? Uh, uh, no, wait. BST. I it's think. B BST. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Let me let me fix this right away. BST. BTC is kind of UTC uh, in British, but wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me do this again. Oop. Here we go. Okay. All so, right. So See you in ten minutes. Yep. Breaks.
Yeah, we're not getting any audio in myself. Sorry, that uh, was my my little thing. Was <laughs> so now now you hear me? <clears throat> yep. Yep. Um, yeah. Actually, so just before, before you start, I, I just wanted to say to everyone that um, what we've what we've done in this tutorial um, is like the absolute barest minimum of stuff that you can do with Brian. Uh, do, do please have a look at the documentation. We, we might try and cover some more advanced topics in um, future uh, um, online tutorials like this. Uh, but do have a look at the at the documentation because there's there's a ton of stuff that we didn't even have close to enough time to talk about that uh, that's worth knowing about. Indeed. Um, maybe before we continue, I mentioned this just before the break, but in case you, you cannot run stuff on your own computer because you have some installation issues. So there's Google Colab with the instructions um, that were part of the of the original installation instructions. And if you sneak in an additional exclamation mark, pip install simpy equals equals 1.2, um, it should work. Otherwise, there's also the notebook on the binder infrastructure that um, Dan presented in the very beginning. The link is also in the installation instruction or, um, or also in the, uh, in this ether, etherpad, this or oh, maybe maybe I'll give that link again for some people that joined late because it has all the links we are going to use. So it's this thing. It has all the links, uh, including the the binder, and um, that is that should work as well. As a reminder. Um, for this binder, it's it's not a permanent thing. So, if you want to keep the work you're doing in there, you have to download it. Otherwise, it will disappear. Okay. Um, so now we're going to to do a little project, and we I think we're a bit of victim of our own uh, success because I think we didn't expect that many participants. So currently, there are still uh, seventy seven people. So the, the general idea is that I have a little idea for a project that I'd like to everyone to do and uh, I'll give a little introduction what it is about and provide you with some code to get started that you can then extend with um, with ho hopefully with a with everything that you got from the tutorial. Um, so during the projects wh while you are working on it we we're currently in, in parallel kind of discussing how we are actually going to handle it. So Zoom has this breakout room feature where we can create uh, individual rooms where a couple of you could be together. That doesn't mean that necessarily you have to um, work on the project together because for that, I mean, you'd have to share code in some way and so on. But it could be just a place um, like a co-working space, <laughs> you work together, and if you have a question or something doesn't work, you can you can try to help each other. And of course, we are also around. So, if I'm not mistaken, I have to admit I never used this feature. But the breakout rooms have uh, like something like an "ask for help" button that should uh, signal us that uh, you need some some help. And also, we'd uh, jump around and um, visit the individual breakout rooms to see how things are going, and maybe if there's some um, reoccurring things, we could talk about it in the in the general meeting. Um, Ada, what, what what do you think about this approach? Do you maybe can you vote with yes if you think this this is something? doable. Yeah, basically it's yes for breakout rooms, no for maybe doing it individually. Right. That is um, five to three at the moment. Yeah, and just to remind everyone to, to vote, you go, you click on participants uh, in your in your Zoom window. Uh, and then I think you should just see buttons saying yes and no. Indeed. So it's, it's, well, it's pretty even. <laughs> yeah, it's hundred percent even. <laughs> that is perfect. So that's, oh, wow, it goes up and still, okay. Now, now, no is slightly ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, someone's maybe, bringing up the point that breakout rooms uh, might be a bit fiddly for doing this. Oh, and no suddenly maybe. leapt ahead, actually. 
Right, indeed. Um, so should we do individually? Oh, okay. I mean, the thing with individually is how, how are we going to uh, help people individually? Like, do you want to all individually like share your screen and, and uh, show something in front of everyone or um, do it by chat or? Yeah, and it's going to be tricky. I mean, one. It looks like the nose have it to me, but. Yeah. Yeah, I never did this kind of um, project supervision with so many people in parallel over video. So, so it is certainly tricky. I mean, one one option would be to um, um, to have people work individually, and then they use the race. If there are questions, they use the race hands feature, and we could yeah, let's do the that. Questions like. Um, in front of everyone. Yeah, let's do that. I think it looks like Noah is slightly ahead, and I think that's going to be technically simpler to cope with for us. Yeah. Okay. We we tried. I mean, this is this is an experiment, and if it doesn't work at all, I mean, at some point we we'll stop to do some recap, and in the end, maybe we can have some. Uh, the plan was after the the project, we'll have some general discussion gather gather some feedback from from you and also if there's some like questions you didn't feel were answered during the tutorial i mean questions that are answerable in a short time frame we we can talk about that okay we'll try that so so i'm going to present you you a, a little project now and um, you'll try working on it and if you have questions either either notify us in the chat or... Um... Yeah, I mean, we could just answer the questions that come up in the chat. Nobody has to... Uh... Right. Yeah. Yeah, or, or you signal us with this uh, raised hand feature that you would like something that you find is difficult to explain in the chat, then we could let you share the screen and, and have a look at it together, maybe. Yeah, by the way, there's some chat about doing it in the Neuromatch style. Um, I, I would be very happy to do that if I if I knew what it was and how to do it technically. Um, so maybe if we're running this again, um, some we I, I can I can chat to some of the Neuromatch uh, Academy people about about how uh, how how is the right way to do that because I guess you already have uh, have some experience with that. Um, yeah, but I think right. for now, just to get things done, we'll just do it individually. It'll be easier. Indeed, in a, in a, in a way. Um... Uh, in in a way, this project can can also be a, a kind of homework. I mean, um, it's it's kind of like a homework that you can do on your own here. And if you have question, ask us on the in the chat or or use the raise hand feature or um, or something like that. And and we'll try to 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 get to people. And maybe if something is coming up that is of general interest, I'll. Um, I'll talk about it um, to everyone. Okay, let's. We'll see how it goes. We 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 are learning. Hopefully, next time everything uh, goes much much smoother. <laughs> okay, so let me get back to my presentation and share it with you. So my idea for the project would be to look at well. Um, uh, to look at what um, simple small networks of neurons can do in the kind of functional sense. And this is all inspired from network of neuro neurons in the cortex and things like working memory, for example. But of course, I mean, I'm neither an ex expert in these topics nor um, nor do we have the time to get into this. And I'm not claiming that our project is modeling these things in any realistic way or whatsoever. So please don't try to base your uh, next publication on, on, on this project. But the idea is just to show that with simple components like neurons and, uh, and this simple integrated fire model that, that Dan used in the tutorial, simple synapses, just by the power of putting things together, having networks and, and putting in some in, input, you can do some um, interesting stuff. So for example, what we can do, um, what people have seen in, 
in um, some areas of the of the brain is that you have something um, like sustained activity in neurons, um, stimulus specific sustained activity. So what this means is you present, for example, um, a stimulus. So in this case, there's there's a cue at one position of the in the visual field of a, of a monkey. So there's a red dot below in, in, in this figure shown here, it's below the fixation point, but it could be above, right? So what, whatsoever. And then this cue switches off. There's a delay period where there's no stimulus in the screen apart from the um, fixation point. And then after this delay period, the monkey has to move the eyes towards the cute point. And what you can see in in the, in the Russell plot on the bottom is that there are um, neurons between the two lines in the middle is the time where no stimulus is present. And this neuron is um, firing consistently during this time. So it kind of remembers, you could say this is a, a substrate of working memory. So the memory of where the cue was is in the activity of this neuron or this neuron is, is part of a population of neuron, but here they only, only measured one neuron. And the way um, we can model this in the simplest way is there's a population of neurons and there's an external input coming in. And this um, population has recurrent excitatory connections. So the neurons excite uh, other neurons among, among, amongst the, the population. And this leads to, to sustained activity, or it could also, in general, it also leads to kind of amplification. So you put in a, a weak stimulus and it gets amplified by this network. If we have just this, um, there, there are problems with the stability of the network, because as you can imagine, there's this excitatory feedback loop. If the population gets more active, it more strongly activ activates other neurons in the network and those then more strongly activate other neurons. And so everything gets more and more active until like everything starts firing like crazy, which uh, would more correspond to something like epileptic activity, but not normal working memory state. So what you typically need additionally in these kind of simple models is another population that is inhibitory. So they get they get excited from the inhibitory population and they feed back um, inhibition to this excitatory population. So now if the excitation gets very strong, then it strongly excites the inhibitory population, which then um, inhibits the excitatory population and reduces the activity in the excitatory population again. And then you can get some kind of equilibrium and everything stays in a nice and, and realistic range and and this this is what i would like you to do in the um for 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 this little project so play uh, play around a bit with a population of first we start with just excitatory neurons connect them amongst each other and see what kind of activity you get is it sustained or not what happens if you change the weights in in these um, in these uh, connections and so on. And then add another, a second population of inhibitory neurons, connect them, see what this does, etc. And I'm giving you some, some code to start with this. If this, um, if, if you get all this done and all this working nicely, you can get one step further and maybe do something even, even slightly more interesting in the, uh, functionality wise, that is create a so-called winner takes all network. What this means is um, there are some networks, especially in things like decision making circuits or sometimes um, for example, for, for visual stimulus that is kind of ambiguous. Some things are moving to the left, some things are moving to the right. You have to decide um, whether it's more moving to the left or more moving to the right. If you look at the activity of neurons that are implicated in these tasks, you see that um, at the beginning, the activity of neurons representative of the left movement and the right movement are active for a fairly same amount. But at some point, 
the activity of one of the population goes up and the activity of the other population goes down. So in this example I'm showing here, I think this is actually from a, from a simulation, not from an experiment, is there are two, um, two populations that are stimulated in, I think, even exactly the same way in this example. But at some point, the activity of one of the um, population gets bigger and it gets very active. And this activity actually suppresses the, the other um, population's activity. So here in these two trials, you have different out outcomes. In the first trial, the second population wins and in the in the first uh, in, the, in the second um, the the first population wins, and we we only need a small extension of our previous model to make something like this possible. So we'll have two inputs: one going to the first population, one going to the second population, and both of them excite the same inhibitory population, and the same inhibitory population feeds back the activity to um, to this model. Okay, so I'll prepare a little um, code to get you started for this. So the link is quite a long GitHub link, but I um, invite you rather to go to this frama.link slash Brian tutorial where you have all the links. Um, and there on this page, it is the last link of um, under the subsection tutorial rel relevant links. <clears throat> So kind of, <coughs> sorry. So the um, fifth bullet point in the in the link list. Sorry. And <clears throat> I'm going to show this uh, code in a, in a minute in a in a notebook. And then there are a couple of things to to explore. Um, so uh, I think I'm only sharing this window. So let me fire up my. Jupyter Notebook, and not that one, but that one, and let me share this with you, which should work like this. So this is the notebook that you're going to find under the link. Um, so in the beginning, well, I'm setting up mine. You've, you've seen this before. I'm using start scope. And here I'm, I'm defining a couple of um, parameters that are used in, in our model. And now, well, the, the model equations look a bit long, but that's mostly because I put a, a, put a couple of comments in there. So maybe, maybe it's actually a bit hard to read because of the comments. Um, but there's nothing... There's not much in there that you didn't see in during the tutorial. So all the basic bits you should have seen already. So what we're having here is a simple integrate and fire model equation um, where there's the membrane potential and a stimulating current and the time constant. And then there's this noise using this XI variable that um, Dan also introduced. So this is um, a stochastic stochastic differential equation. Um, then here there's, there's a thing that I think we didn't use much before, but this is a parameter that defines each neuron. Theta here is a preferred stimulus of the neuron. So this, this model is very abstract and very vague. So a stimulus here could be um, the direction of dots moving on a screen or um, the direction of a bar, or it could even be something like the frequency of an auditory stimulus, for example. So our model is too abstract to make a difference be between all these things. Um, but what I'm doing, because this avoids issues with uh, boundaries, is that I assume that our stimulus variable is periodic. So um, this is would rather fit to something like the direction or position of a point in a circle, because um, yeah, if you go around the circle, the circle starts again. So something like uh, minus pi is the same as pi. So actually I should have, to make this clearer, it's a dimensionless uh, variable, but um, it is um, uh, an angle in radian in a way. So, so I can write it as a radian 
or one for dimensionless, that doesn't make a difference. So this for, for each neuron, I say they have a preferred stimulus. And down here, I initialize it with a value between minus pi and pi. And this expression here basically um, is I, the index of the neuron divided by N. So I goes from zero to N E. So this basically goes, this expression here goes from zero to two pi. So in total, it goes from, from minus pi to pi. And now this is the preferred stimulus of each neuron. And now how much input this um, neuron gets depends on the difference between these preferred stimulus and the actual stimulus. And now I don't, I don't want to go into details of why I do plus pi, uh, modulo two pi, minus pi, but this is a way of dealing with, uh, um, uh, with uh, this periodic nature of the variables. So this way, um, it gets the same input if it prefers something that is very close to two pi and the stimulus is two pi or whether it is something, whether it prefers something that is close to zero, but the stimulus is two pi because it wraps, wraps things around. Don't worry about it too much. The stimulus then depends on this difference and this here, this exponential of minus the stimulus difference squared divided by sigma theta squared means it depends on it in the Gaussian Gaussian way. So the whole population of our neurons has something like a Gaussian tuning curve where depending on the um, on the stimulus orientation direction, whatever you want to call it, um, neurons fire fire in a different way. Threshold and reset like, like we did before for this very simplified, very simple um, integrated fire model where everything is scaled between zero and one. Okay, it, the, the initial value of the membrane potential is just random. We record the spikes of these neurons with a spike monitor and we run the simulation. I'm not sure, I think Dan didn't show this and here it's not super important, but in general, it's a, it's a nice thing to add when you do runs for a simulation, you can add report equals text. And this just gives you some output while the simulation is running, which is especially useful if you have a long running simulation because you get an idea of how long it has been running and how long it will, will still run. In this case here, it's not super important because our, our simulation is super short. So let me actually run it, even though I think I, I already ran it here. Okay, the simulation starts and it runs and I'm plotting. Well, the plotting, plotting is, I'm using a slightly different plot, uh, plotting syntax to, to the syntax I'm, um, uh, Dan was using, but it's the same thing. You don't actually need to do all this. Um, I could also, I didn't do this here, but I could also use Brian Plot. Um, what's the name of our monitor? Xpon and not use this, it should look more or less the same just with dots. So what do we see here? We see um, the, the activity of the neurons. And um, so they are ordered because the way I assigned the, um, the preferred stimulus feature, they, they are ordered from minus pi to pi. So I do the plot differently actually, we see this more clearly. Um, yeah, here it goes from minus pi to pi. And so in this case, the stimulus that I present at zero, so right in the middle, so these neurons that prefer exactly this kind of stimulus fire the most. And the, uh, the further away you, you go from this population, the less you have. If I change this stimulus to say uh, half of pi, then and run the simulation again and do the plot again. Then we see that the population of neurons up there that prefer uh, uh, stimuli around pi half uh, are now more active. Okay, um, maybe, hmm, how can I actually see the chat at the same time? Wait, where is it? 
Um, I go here, that shit. Um, okay. Um, about the code so far, um, is that clear to everyone? Can you, do you think you understand? Oh yeah, you can also vote with yes, no in, in the participants thingy. Um, the, the code is clear or is there anything in there that you'd like to discuss a bit more? Okay, I see a bunch of yes and no, no, so that's, that's good. Okay, great. So, so I give you this code or you already have it if you followed the, the link and I'll put up the link on a, on a slide in a, in a second again. And so what I'd like to explore you. So, so I talked in the beginning about sustained activity. Um, in this network, currently there's no reason that there should be sustained activity because the neurons are only firing because of the input. But as a first thing, what I would like you to do is to actually check this out. Um, whoops, sorry, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, so first, simply switch off the stimulus after the end of the simulation. So run this, um, switch off the stimulus, and you should be able to do this by changing the amplitude of the stimulus, and then run it again for say 500 milliseconds maybe, or another second and see what it does. And the next thing would be um, to introduce synapses. So there are no synapses here in this model so far. So what we like to do is have the excitatory um, population connect to, to the, uh, amongst each, uh, each other. Um, so do this with the with tools that uh, Dan gave you in the tutorial or with the help of the documentation, of course, and see what you get. So you'll need to figure out what is a reasonable weight to set. So in general, um, I'd recommend to, to start with very slow weights because if the, your weights are too big, you get like crazy activity and you, you don't understand what is going on at all. So rather start with uh, low weights and, and decrease them a bit further and see, see where you get. Um, it will be a bit hard to tune it in such a network where there are only um, excitatory connections. But yeah, see, see what you can do. A next uh, interesting thing to, to try would be instead of, um, instead of connecting all neurons to all neurons, use a connection that is more specific. So uh, Dan showed some, uh, some connection patterns and how you can de define conditions for connections. Here you have this stimulus variable. So maybe do something that connects uh, neurons more strongly or more likely if they are close to in stimulus space. Then the next thing, if, if, if this is all working well, would be to introduce an inhibitory population. So this would be, um, this inhibitory population would be more simple than this because you would only have um, a membrane potential but no, no stimulus. Um, because they don't receive any stimulus. Instead, uh, they, they just receive input with a new group of synapses from the excitatory neurons, and they will project back to the excitatory neurons with inhibitory synapses. And then if this works, then you can do a lot of stuff with this model. You could introduce, um, for example, a second stimulus, so you can try out things like winner takes all dynamics, or here the stimulus is constant over time, but you could change this into something that changes over time in amplitude or in stimulus feature, whatever you can, can, can come up with basically. So I think that's, that's it from my side about the general introduction. Um, I'll get, maybe it's, better to put it like this on the screen. Um, maybe one more time, the neuron group uh, definition, I seeing this in this chat. Do, do, do you mean going over the neuron uh, group definition and explaining it? Or, I mean, you, you have access to the code, so, so it's not a question of um, 
rewriting everything from scratch. Or is the question about go, going over the definition once more? Uh, you, you mean just just going over it again in in the in the code? Let me see what I can do. Oop. Maybe it's easier if I actually stay on this. Yeah, they're, they're, they're comments. But basically, the, the first thing is the most similar to, to everything that Dan talked in the um, tutorial. It's the, the membrane potential with a noise, so that it's a bit noisy. You can also leave it away if you, if you don't want it. And then the, the bit complex part is the diffusion of the stimuli stimulus so i mean it's 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 a really simplified model of course um real neurons they don't receive a, a stimulus current that depends on the the stimulus but here um that's that's our way of modeling it so it's a gaussian function of the difference of the preferred stimulus of the neuron and the presented stimulus and this stimulus difference is calculated in a bit of complicated way to deal with the uh, periodic boundary conditions with the fact that it's a circular variable. And the, um, the neurons preferred stimulus is stored in this theta variable. So if I do something like x neurons dot theta, maybe it's, you see, um, well, the first one has minus pi and then it goes up to, to pi for the, for the values. Okay, these are many values, maybe I shouldn't have printed them. Um, could also plot them, of course. And um, yeah, that's it basically. Okay, let's let's try that. So um, yeah, you you have the code either as um, as a Jupyter notebook, the one I, I just showed you, or there's also just a Python uh, code if you if you're not using the notebook but I guess all of you are using in some way or the other. Um, it's all on this Frama link. Oops, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, on, the, on the Frama link Brian tutorial page, um, which links to the, to the GitHub page. But the, this way you don't have to type this long link. And okay. Um, so I'm going to, to shut up for a moment and uh, let you, let you explore and hack away on it and yeah please do ask questions in the in the chat or um, raise a hand in the participants uh, thingy and we'll try to answer them and in the in the end we'll maybe do do a little feedback round and see where uh, whether anyone wants to present their result and talk about it. And we'll also do some general feedback about how, how the day went and what you liked, what you didn't like, even though I'm not sure how many people will be left at the very end after this four hour marathon, but we'll see. Okay, so happy, happy hacking away on the project. So sorry, Marcel, I, I actually posted the feedback link because I thought we were running a bit low on time, so we probably wouldn't do feedback at the end. So some people have already been filling it out already. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, so so for the feedback, uh, that's that's good. Huh? Yeah, and I'm also going to, as someone says, I'm going to email it out afterwards as well, um, because I think we didn't have time to go through it interactively. But uh, yeah, quite a lot of people already filled it out, so we're getting some useful feedback already. Amazingly, some people told me that they finished the project already on the feedback, so... <laughs> How? how? <laughs> well, while, while I was uh, presenting it. That's really? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, if, if anyone wants to share what they did at, at some point, I'd be happy to have a look. You could also, I mean, potentially, if, if you want to share your um, project with others, maybe on the, on the Frama linky thing, I mean, if, if everyone copy and paste their code, that will be a bit too, too much, but um, maybe I'll, in the very end, 
um, I'll, I'll, I'll add a little section where you can, if, if you feel like it, that you want to like to have some feedback on a more or less finished project, upload it somehow, uh, say, be it on a Dropbox or if you're using GitHub or on something like CodeShare or whatever means uh, you, you have to upload code somewhere and add a link to it here in the, in the Ether band and we can have a, can have a look. Um, also, there's been some discussion about how how to uh, how to do the the project bait. Um, but I think we'll take on board for next time. I think at this point, it's now probably too late to change the way we're doing it. Um, but I'll 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 tell, I'll keep that in mind for next time we're doing it because there were some good ideas. All right. Wait, 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 wait. Cool. Yeah. So, so uh, I, I guess I, I put myself into into mute mute for a moment until until there are questions to discuss. Happy happy hacking. Yeah, so a couple of people are actually saying that they, that they haven't got time to do the project now and uh, that they're going to do it as homework. I think that's quite a good idea, actually. Um, it lets you explore a little yeah. bit more um, calmly. And how about we suggest that people write to the um, Brian email support um, if they have questions on, on how to do it as a way of following up? That's true, yeah. Maybe, um, yes, yeah, a support list the best. Hmm. Well, where else could we, we could have, we have this? alternative option? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the future, we're, we're thinking about coming up with a new way to do Brian support where we'll basically have forums that can have different rooms and stuff. And then obviously we could put it in a, in a Brian tutorial room. But for the moment, yeah, Neurostars is one of the options we're considering. Um, but for the moment, we haven't done that. Um, but uh, yeah, that's definitely uh, an option that we're considering. Uh, yeah, other, otherwise one option would be, um, I mean, this, um, this, this from our link, uh, etherpad thingy, this would stay around for a month or I think a month after the last edit or something. So in principle, people could also write their questions directly in there and or share links to code or, or code snippets. I'm not sure. Is that better than, than having doing it over Brian's support? There seems to be a lot of uh, support for Neurostars in the, in the chat, which is probably coming from, it looks like it's coming from names I recognize from Neuromatch Academy. So uh, I, I think that's because they used it for Neuromatch Academy. Um, I think we're both on Neurostars. So if you, if, if there's a way, I haven't really used uh, Discourse much, but if there's a way to at mention uh, me or Marcel, um, we, you can just put it under the general chat for the moment. Um, and we'll probably see those messages. Um, maybe that's better than the. Yeah, that would work as well. Yeah, or is the. And like that's can, a good test for us. New, as new as tags works, so. automatic, uh, but can you introduce new tags? Apparently, by yeah, yourself? you can make a brand tag. Someone saying. But maybe, maybe make uh, let's for for this project make it a bit more specific now. Um, like a brand tutorial maybe, tag. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe a brand tutorial tag. To, because in the, I mean, in the long run, maybe I mean we didn't decide on it yet, but we would like it as a general support forum for for Brian. And I think if if people are looking for general support stuff and they're uh, they're coming across a, a bunch of uh, uh, questions about the project, that would be a bit odd. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, so basically, I think uh, uh, we're, we're okay with that. If you want to ask on Neurostars, we're also okay, I think, if you want to send emails to the Brian support line, uh, Brian support uh, email list, that, that probably would work fine too. And we'll, we'll check out the, um, the, uh, the Framer thing as well. Um, 
if anyone wants to use that. Yeah, exactly. So maybe, I mean, now, now some people also left and uh, maybe some of the people uh, were, were also interested in doing something like this. So maybe, maybe when you send the email after, um, after the event, uh, you could also mention this, that um, everyone is free to work on this project as a homework and ask question in one of these three ways we, we just mentioned. Mm. Oh, we'll, yeah, well, that sounds, sounds like a good, good plan to me. Yeah. So that means that works. this meeting we would kind of wrap up now, maybe, maybe before we do this. I mean, I I mean I'm, I'm happy to hang around for another half hour if people want to start having a go. I just, there's quite a few people yeah. who have been leaving. So uh, it would make sense to, to have some way that they can continue to interact over this. Um, in fact, there you go. There's one, there's a question right now. Right. Two. Uh, yeah, actually, sorry, I was at the same time I was looking at the, the questions on Mentimeter because I, I mean, I didn't, didn't answer, we, we didn't answer all of them, but at some point they, they got very specific. Um, I'm checking, but I, I don't think there's anything about the project there. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, maybe... Yeah, maybe maybe just uh, because because some people are uh, um, discussing whether they can actually have sustained activity uh, just with random all to all connectivity. Uh, you can to to some point, but it's 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 quite limited in what you can do. I mean, you can have relatively strong connections, and it will um, it will definitely sustain things a bit. But it's hard to tweak it to to a point where it's um, uh, where it is sustained for a significant amount of time, but where where it doesn't blow up everything, so it's it, it is it is tricky. When I when I tried this out, um, I fiddled around with it, and you have to tune it quite carefully, and you don't get amazing uh, amazing sustained activity. So it's not a thing that can sustain the activity over over seconds. Um, with if you if you have additionally inhibition, it it gets much uh, it gets much better. Um, okay, maybe there's some other. Right, there's some questions and some answers. It's nice, yeah. Exactly. So there's an example posted for how you could um, uh, how you could um, write um, a connection condition. Yeah, that, that would be one option. So that means if the um, if the theta of the pre and the post synaptic cell are, are not no more different than something, you don't actually have to multiply the number by radian because radian is dimensionless. But I agree, it makes well makes sense maybe. Or you can use something like pi divided by four or something like this. The the only the only thing that is a bit um, tricky about this condition is that this would, yeah, so, so Sigurd is actually mentioning, it, this wouldn't take care of the boundaries. So this would not connect a cell that is close to two pi in its preference to a cell that has zero um, as its preference, even though in, in circular terms, the two are, uh, are very close. So to, to make it probably, uh, yeah, you would need to to do something like this. There's actually actually another way to do it. Um, um, if if you don't want to think about this, is you can decompose it into into several or conditions. So you just you first just connect those which are which are close without crossing the boundary, and then you do something like or um, something like theta pre plus two pi minus theta post is smaller than a certain number. So you shift the value of the presynaptic population by, by two pi to make it comparable to, to the other. And this way you get all, all those connection of those that cross um, from close to zero to close to two pi. And then you do the same thing a second time for for the connections in the in the other way. There are things like this, and actually, 
uh, on the on the Brian support mailing list, I I talked about this very very recently. Uh, we actually don't have a link to. I, I'll put a link to the mailing list also in the in the Frama thingy. Okay, an obvious way to connect the. Okay, there's some someone uh, a bit a bit lost. So um, implementing things myself. So please don't start from scratch. Uh, there's some code that is available under the link. The code to get started, or or did you did you use that code and still you don't know where to start? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, so, so what I would start with is first uh, try, well, try the try the first point. Um, after the run, switch off the stimulus and continue the run and do the plot and see what you get. This should be fairly straightforward. Um, you don't have to, to to add much code to that. Then the next thing would be to add synapses. For this, you can hopefully copy and paste a bit of code that you find in uh, in, in dense tutorial. So you need synapses connecting to excitatory neurons to each other. And the synapses need to have some kind of effect. So the easiest would be to use the synaptic model that Dan used in the very beginning. That is um, for each incoming spike. So on pre, increase the um, increase the the uh, post synaptic potential and then tweak the weights and yeah so so alexander is posting something um <laughs> that I, I i can understand that you're confused because that's uh, a way too high weight but um the thing is your synapses are not doing anything you defined the weight but you didn't define an on pre action so the synapses are there they have a weight but if a spike arrives they're not doing anything with a weight <laughs> uh there's a question about any plan about training networks in future tutorials so you i guess you mean by that more um more like machine learning inspired thing or something where you have plasticity or something like that or SDDP, yeah. I think uh, plasticity in particular SDDP would certainly be a topic. I mean, if we, I think if our, if Dan would have had like half an hour more time for the synapses tutorial, that would be the next topic to um, to talk about. So um, how to have plastic synapses and SDDP is, is um, one of the most interesting things. Yeah, and maybe doing something like more machine learning um, that would be more more dense domain, but um, possibly, yeah. About the question about make the synapses do something. So the easiest thing to make them do something is add something like uh, like this to to the synapse definition. So on pre means when a presynaptic spikes. Um, arrives, then the post synaptic membrane potential should be increased by the weight. This is the simplest possible synapse model you can think of, what people call a delta synapse. If you want to make it more complex, you could introduce a synaptic current, for example, in the way that that then uh, did at some point during the tutorial. Yeah, Siegfried is asking a good question about the, the function for the probability inside connect is a bit tricky. Um, indeed, um, unfortunately, there's not an easy way. If you want to ha really have a complex function, there's currently not an easy way to do this. There's a way to extend, um, extend Brian and to make it support new functions that are non-standard functions, you could define them. But that is a bit non non trivial and maybe not what you would need here. What you sometimes can do is um, a trick that I used in the in the code 
Um, uh, yeah, that is um, that I used in the code where I defined this stimulus diff variable. Um, so introduce a new variable that calculates something that simplifies your expression later. Um, but I mean, in, in the end, um, if you have something very complex and that doesn't, um, there's no way to easily express it in the Brian syntax, what you can always do is to create your connections, the indices for the pre and the post synaptic synapses in some way using Python, uh, NumPy, and then just pass them in with a connect statement where you specify i equals comma j equals and then, then the actual numbers. So you would calculate basically the, the indices yourself and then just ask Brian to connect them according to these indices. It's kind of like the, the fallback solution if, if Brian's syntax is, is too complicated for, for your task. Okay, there's a question about the documentation rather. Yeah, the link to the, I'm not sure actually when I, when I change my windows, do, do windows change for you or do you still see the, the slide? We still see the slide. Even if I change the windows, okay, this way I can look in the documentation myself and uh, share the link without annoying everyone. So, it's actually, <laughs> So I'm posting two links. So this one is for, oh wait, no, wait, maybe this one is better. Yeah, Oop. so I think I didn't, didn't post the best link before, but this is a link for the list of special symbols we support in, in Brian. Where some of them only well only um, only are only relevant for synapses like J for example and only uh, some are only relevant for a neuron group like um, the not refractory variable for example. Okay. Oh, I didn't see the question before, but there was a question whether there's a minimum operation that is defined. Um, no, there's not. And the reason, uh, basically, in general, there are no functions that, um, the minimum function would be the, um, um, uh, would be a function that changes kind of the shape. So it's not clear how this would, work within the equations because the minimum of several values is one values. So that's uh, well in computer science parlance, that's a reduction. And um, yeah, they, you, you cannot, we don't have support for a specific syntax for that. I mean, in a way, synapses implement a reduction, but that's a bit uh, going far. Actually, it's arctan, I think. Um, let me up, give you a link to the list of functions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I had to look it up. I didn't, I didn't remember whether it's A10 or R10. Um, Your explo uh, network exploded successfully, <laughs> that's great. 
so so i didn't didn't mention it before but actually in the in the um, uh, model i i gave you uh things can explode in a in a bad way also because um there's no uh no refractory period so as I guess all of you know, uh, real neurons in the real brain, they, they cannot fire with uh, like, you know, 10,000 spikes uh, uh, a second because yeah, they have a refractory period of you know, a couple of milliseconds. And in, in this model that I shared with you as a starting point, um, there's no such thing. So um, they can actually, f in principle, they can fire one spike every time step. But, uh, yeah, it, it gets a bit slow with many connections. Yeah, that's um, that's understandable. Um, it's also you can instead of instead of all to all, what you can also do, and which is almost the same effect, um, would be to to just reduce the number of connections by by just connecting them with a certain probability. So instead of just a connect statement, use connect with p equals. 0 0.2 or something like this. So you get fewer connections, but functionally that shouldn't change much because it's still random and kind of all to all in, in principle. Also at some point, I mean, we were always using the NumPy backend um, because it, it, it starts up faster and for these simple examples that better. But if you get uh, there, if your network gets more complex, maybe it's worth uh, switching it back to its default, so so setting it to auto for automatic or to Cython for to switch on the C code generation. We will take a bit longer to start up, but it should be a bit faster to run. Even though, don't expect wonders. Uh, it should, I think, in uh, in general, it's like twice as fast or something. To get it much faster than that, you'd need to use the um, the C++ standalone mode, but this 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 mode is a bit tricky to use in notebooks and for repeated runs and so on. So, so I wouldn't try this now, even though in in the long run that might be something interesting to get into because it can be quite a lot faster. So there's a question of whether we can, ah, whether we can access variables during a run. Um, yes and no. So the the magic, the magic system to do stuff during the run, is what we call a network operation in Brian. I'm going to to paste a link to this. Um, a network operation is is something you can write an arbitrary uh, arbitrary Python function, and with network operation, this function will be called regularly during the run. You can use this. So normally you shouldn't call such a function every time step because that slows down everything, but you could do something like this to um, to to do plots continuously by say every 10 milliseconds in this Python function, look at the recent values in the state monitor and plot them. Um, so for the general mechanism of network operation, which is kind of like the, whatever what you want to do, which you cannot express in Brian syntax, but which you want to have done during a run, Everything that is like this, you can write in a in a Python function and tie them into your into your simulation using a network operation. And actually, when we wrote our last paper, we used this to do an interactively running simulation that also plots things interactively. Let me give you a link to this example. Put it up on GitHub and it is called. Well, there are the two different variants. So, I mean, that's for, for the real. 
for people that are really interested in doing something like this, I'm posting the link. Um, there's some work involved to, to get this running. And in the link I posted, it's just a link to the notebook. Uh, you just have a view of the notebook, so you don't see that it's interactive in any way. You have to download this notebook and run it on your own machine to actually um, see the thing running interactively. But it shows you can do it. There's a button to start things, sliders and so on. It's a bit of work, but not too much in the end. I mean, most of the work is to, to get the plot look nice and so on. But tying it in with a, with a Brian simulation is not that difficult. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, it's, it's still it's not trivial. I wouldn't uh, recommend it if you just started using Brian. I like fun regularly. Um, the best way to run my theta in iterations. <laughs> um, so the theta of the stimulus or um, the theta of the preferred of the preferred stimulus, because currently um, the theta of the stimulus is outside. Okay, the the preferred stimulus. Um, the preferred stimulus. Well, you could do uh, what was the group called X neurons and then run regularly and write theta equals um, some random value times two times pi, for example. Or maybe I think in the rest of the thing uh, between minus pi and pi, something like this. So this would um, change the, the preference to a random preference, but this would do it every time step. So what you probably rather want to do is something like, I don't know, every 500 milliseconds, the um, preferences scramble around. Well, I'm not sure that's what you want to do, but that's what you could do. Okay, that's uh, directly, so Ashwin, I had to get. To, I'm trying to frame a condition where the difference of stimuli uh, between the source and target neuron is less than some number. Yeah. Um, so that's the the easiest. Well, the the rough way would be to do some to do a condition for the connection that is something like this. That means that the theta for the presynaptic cell and the theta by the postsynaptic cell don't differ by more than pi divided by eight. The problem, and we discussed this a bit earlier in the chat, is that this um, doesn't take care of the boundary conditions. So instead, you would have to use something uh, like what is used in the stim diff variable in the, in the code I gave you that does uses this modulo two pi and so on. But another option is um, to, another option would be to, um, to have separate connection statements to, um, to divide it. Let me actually, given that I answered the same question recently on the, on the mailing list, I'm, yeah. That is, so there's a, uh, oh nice, yeah, you can, you can convert and take, but yeah, this, so the last posted one, this is something which, which I would have done. Um, the plus pi modulo two pi minus pi trick. Uh, in this case, it's, it's not, um, it's not just a, a, a cutoff, but it's, it's also like a normal, function 
like a Gaussian of the distance in in stimulus. Um, but let me just also post a link to if you if you cannot um, cannot wrap your head around to this this. Uh, link I just give you a link to a periodic boundary conditions there's a way if it's especially if it's not actually a periodic variable um, there are different ways to do periodic boundary conditions so there's an answer to that with the, with an example. Maybe that could be could be helpful. Oh, you you get by stable switching with, without any inhibition, or do you have some some kind of inhibitory me mechanism? Ah, okay, with the inhibition, great. Yeah, it would be it would be great if you I don't know where, but if you if you feel like it, uh, if you want to share your uh, your result with others, that would be great. I think we are kind of. Yeah, we. I guess it's maybe a bit too late. To, or I mean, if you if you want to, you could have a look at your at your results. If you want to, as a final as a final thing for this tutorial, if you want to to share your screen, Rishika, I think uh, you could. I'm not sure whether I'm. I think um, Dan would have to give you the right to share your screen, uh, only only if you if you want to, of course. Ah, okay, I see. Yeah, but if feel free to to share your your code or or even a result figure in any way you uh, you you feel fit. So, uh, for example, on this from a link thing uh, on the on the very bottom, you could put a link to to some uploaded version or on your stars, for example. It would be great, I'd be happy to have a look. And I guess others as well. I'll probably also share um, in the in the GitHub repository where there's some material, I also share some, uh, some code that I wrote, which was something that I had in mind as a kind of like answer to the, to the, to the question. Even though I'm not saying that it's perfect or anything, but it's something. Okay, great. I think Dan, that might be a good good way to wrap thing a uh, good good time to wrap things up, right? Yeah, I think so. Um, my daughter's on the way back from nursery, so it's uh, a good time for me. Um, cool. All right. I, so my impression is that this has been a success. People seem to be happy about it. Um, I think it's likely we'll run another one. Um, I've already been looking at the feedback, and it looks like. Um, people have strong ideas about uh, what they would like from a, from a future session. So uh, we'll take a look at that and, uh, and think about the best way to, uh, to do that. Okay, yeah, cool. I also Thank saw you, that uh, some people are interested in like forming a group to, uh, to, to learn Brian together. I, I'm not sure whether there's any way we could facilitate that or... No, I think we could do that if we had if we had moved to discourse, right. we could maybe make rooms for it yeah. and stuff like that. But this seems like another argument that we should be doing something yeah. like that. Okay, we keep that in mind. Um, ah, right. Yes, there's there's um, yeah there's there's Mattermost brain hack. That's uh, another option that's quite nice actually. Um, yeah. Okay, we should consider that. Okay. Yeah, we have plenty of stuff to consider. Okay. That's more like a Slack. So yeah, that's the right way of doing it. Cool. Okay, great. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, thank Thanks you everyone. everyone for coming. And uh, yeah, see you next time. And yes, I will email out. Uh, I'm, I'm going to make a YouTube channel, upload this there. I'll email that out. Um, and yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see how that goes. I'll, and I'll email out the feedback. And I think that there was some 
uh, was there some code that Marcel was going to include in that? I can't remember. But anyway, we'll 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 look through and uh, and email out anything that seems relevant based on what we've discussed today. Okay, great. Oh, cool. all right. Thank you, everyone. Nice. Okay. Have a nice um, should, weekend. Should I leave this open, this room open for everyone, and people can uh, continue to chat, or should I close it now? I don't know. Um, I guess people. Well, it looks like people are uh, filtering uh, out, so I think yeah. I'll probably just close it. I think so too. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks for hosting and organizing everything in the first place. You're welcome. Cool. All right. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. Bye. See you. Bye-bye.